Have you ever done one of these before? No, I never talked on anything before, actually. No, I mean like a longer than two minute interview deal. It, Trevor, that's what Trevor like. Jacob was probably the only one that had me do that. What's you, that? You ever, you ever seen Trevor, uh, Trevor Jacobs? Uh, nah. Well, then plus uh, you got the drinking bros. Those guys, uh, those guys, a lot of fun. So you're all over this. Yeah, generally, I don't, I don't know. I just, they give me excuses like, Hey, you want to come drink beer? I'm like, sure. And every podcast I've ever been on, they hand me a beer and I'm like, all right, it's 12 o'clock somewhere. Let's do this. Well, let's start it with that then. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Bring this bad boy real close. Oh, real close. I already I feel like I'm already kind of loud. No, no, no. no you're you good. good. No, you're good. All right. We'll have a quick drink. Yeah. You know, just to kick things off. It's always easier uh, when you, uh, well, it is past noon. So we can, yeah, look way past noon. So the we're stories good. get better when your inhibitions go down. Lubricated. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just don't even really know where to start one of these. Cause it's like, this is the, you're one of the few people that is like, you're not really human. Like you could be easily. <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel human. Like I feel you, really old. <laughs> <laughs> but then you got like, you got like a Kelly Slater and then you got like a Travis Pastrana and then you get like these, like a Tom Brady. It's like the, the, the level of stuff that you can do compared to like the normal population. No, you're just like, I appreciate you, you putting me on that, that level. You have two of the, probably the all time. And I know you mentioned American football, which is kind of funny, but the, you know, you have guys that have accomplished a lot and succeeded a lot. And then you've got me who's actually made a living by crashing stuff. Now I've done just well enough and hung in there. I mean, anyone that's driven a rally car as long as I have mm. would probably have uh, more championship. Like I've literally, I started driving go-karts at, at two. I rolled my first go-kart before I was three years old. I've been driving Bobcats and building my own ramps and creating jumps and uh, working on, on cars and vehicles. I mean, growing up that redneck full bogan yeah. kind of mentality and been lucky enough that it's just kind of Work continues out. to evolve. Yeah. Um, and then just usually hold a pin and see what happens. But I've, I, the championships weren't really my thing, you know, like I the guys overrated. that you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> overrated. Let's just go for the, go for the day. But when you think about like, like I think about X games, lumberjack outfit, <laughs> Like double backflip and the world is just standing there going, he's actually going to do this. And it, then you do it and it happens. And it's like the way that you've made stuff happen. And it's like, but it's, I think what makes it cooler is like, it's not the championship. It's not the AMA motocross. It's like people have done that stuff before. <laughs> what you do is like the shit where everyone's like, nah, nah, I don't think that I want to do that. So that's where you get that like non- that's what I'm saying. Like you're an alien. Like it's just <laughs> this weird shit. And then, I mean, just today, like we're out with Harry Bink and he's doing doubles and it's like so rad, but he was on the podcast and like, he said the famous now famous <laughs> line. Some people believe in God. I believe in Travis Pastrana. Like that's what you did for kids like him. Like what's Harry Bink going to do? that's better than the nitro circus. Like he's built for that arena and like that's and, and your he, platform. He you crushes know I mean? it. But this is, this is the cool part about action sports. And I think the culture kind of went um, a different direction when money starts coming in with anything. And even the Olympics, everyone's like, Oh, this is awesome. We got, um, you know, skating and, and snowboarding and all this stuff goes to the Olympics. And I think it's great for the sport and, and money is good, but why these sports succeeded and why they're so awesome is who Harry Bink is. He was mm. made to go out there no matter what he does, if it's working out, if it's partying, if it's riding his dirt bike, he is all in and mm. he is so much fun and so much energy. And just, he brings everyone around him up to his level in good, bad, and different, whatever he's doing. And that charisma, that excitement is what action sports is built on. And this is, we've been able to find these guys in nitro circus and well, they've kind of found us. Found uh, honestly, <laughs> I mean, um, How do you get on nitro tour? Um, well, there's not really that much of a criteria. You just got to be a pinner. Yeah. You got to be the best in the world at what you do are willing to do something that no one else is willing to do. And everyone says, well, how do you, how do you get on? I said, well, Look, I mean, you got guys like Brennan Schmidt who just, uh, you know, he qualified second in the world last year in big air at, uh, at world games ended up, I think fourth, but he's a snowboard guy. That's a roller board guy on the show. And he does contraptions, does all the stuff. Gavin Godfrey, same thing came from wrestling background, just really durable, but these guys love life. They come on nitro circus. They hang out with all these guys that are just so motivated to progress. And it's not just about going out and put on a show. These guys, every single day, some of the greatest stuff comes in practice when they don't have to be out there. Yeah. It's hot. It's cold. It's whatever you're on tour, you're sick. And these guys like our Willie, they're out there for four or five hours every day. As soon as that ramp goes up, they're out there. Even like Jake's on a plane. We always said, uh, with, uh, just 
basically Jake Brown who went out and the skater, you know, that mentality, like yeah. I'm always like, Oh, the skater's never going to fit on, fit in on this. He was the first guy up last one to sleep. He was DJing at the, whatever bar he could find, <laughs> at, you know, two o'clock in the morning, but he was up and these guys are just so passionate. And that is the, the Harry Binks. That's the guys that are yeah. on tour. And if you can do something, no one else can do this day and age, put it on the internet. It'll go viral. You'll be on nitro circus, but careful what you ask for. <laughs> Dude, that's for real. Like look at Trevor Piranha. Like, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Bro, like <laughs> two stroke week a couple of years ago, that the that whole deal, that was like nothing. And then it's like that comes out of you get on with the crew, you prove yourself, you do something that's special and unique. And then it's like you you literally can change your life through um, just having a crack, pushing the envelope. You know what I mean? But it's funny. Cause everyone goes, Oh, Piranha. I wish I had what he had. Dude, Trevor's a guy that comes over the house. Literally he's there every day. He works at the local drag strip and he works at a snowboard shop during the winters, um, picks up odds and ends jobs, even street bike Tommy. Everyone's like, where's Tommy? I'm like, Oh, he's, he's back working for his dad construction, hanging sheet rock. And people laugh. I'm like, dude, there's not as much money as people think in action sports. You do it because yeah. you're passionate. You love it. And you know, even nitro circus, almost everything we make goes back into, um, ramp development and every, yeah. all the videos and what just, what we love to do, because if we're not getting paid to do it, we're still paying to do it. So let's, let's keep evolving. But back to piranha, not to get off on another tangent, which like I'm tangents of what we do. <laughs> well, I've come Gypsy to the right tangents. place. Yeah. Gypsy tangents is like the proper, proper name for the podcast. Oh, geez. But so piranha, man, um, he's always, we have a lift, a car lift for, you know, rally cars and mostly mm. the razor stuff at the house. So he's always building stuff and tinkering with stuff. And he's always the first one. You don't have to ask him to do anything. He's the first guy working on everything. And yeah, he drinks a little much. Yeah. He's, um, he's really smart and he could probably be doing a lot more with his life than working odds and ends jobs. And hey, but that EMT job will still and, be there at the end of this whole deal, you know? Yeah. But you know, he goes down there and he's like, I love three wheelers. And when all, we're all going, like we just quadding through all this stuff and he brings us three wheel. He's stuck half the time. He's by himself. Cause we just ditch him because he can't make it, but he refuses. He's like two strokes. I'm going to build everything that I have is two stroke. Everything that I have, uh, he builds himself. He finds it's like it's just one of those guys that he loves loves what he does and he found his niche. It doesn't matter. Like all the guys at the house, we got a guy called comb over Steve. Like <laughs> he's mentally probably handicapped. No offense. Come over. I mean, he's a good, great, <laughs> but he is the first guy up every morning. He works so hard on the ramps. He's yeah. an awesome fabricator. He's a great welder. And everybody that comes over to what they call Pastrana land, they work. And it doesn't matter. Like before X games, when I used to still do X games, uh, all my friends would take off work for two weeks to take shifts on helping me out of the foam pit. Mm. And it's not easy. And getting in there, you're, you're fluffing the pit. It's usually a hundred, 105 degrees. Um, yeah, where you're at is ridiculous. It's it's hell sticky. And these guys will take off work to basically work for free beer. Yeah. And now I say free beer and then everyone's like, Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Cause they know what that means. Like after like four hours of free beer. But, and then back to the, the first tangent that we started off on Trevor Piranha goes to Kevin Windham's house and I was there and it was heavy. <laughs> keeps k up up all night. Like, cause k he doesn't get done working on the track until probably yeah. midnight and stuff. He's, you know, Kevin's good, good old boy, man. Yeah. And, uh, Piranha's there at his house. Cause we were basically staying at his house and he's like, ah, oh, come on, have a drink, have another. So then Kevin's got to get up at like four 30. Well, Piranha sleeps in, misses the first practice. Well, he shows up on the starting line and k tired. Everyone's kind of like, just having we have fun. to like actually drag Kevin out of the house. Cause he was like, he was like, no, I'm not coming. And we <laughs> were like, yeah, we're event. all like, we're like, no, like you kind of have to come. Like we've flown here. Like I can't, I don't know where we flew from. We flew from Florida or something to like film with you guys. But well, you have to be there. Yeah. But for, forget about like us and filming. Like he's putting on an area. A qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we go out there and, and it was the funniest thing to see. Wyndham had a sit down talk with Piranha at the end. Cause Trevor goes up and Kate up took up. We were right. Rainer and I were on one twenty fives. Um, you know, Bartram was there. He had Brett Q, um, you know, a couple of the other guys, yep. but, um, Piranha had the 500. So Kate up starts last and it's only a four lap race, but Kate up. Couldn't he pass me, pass Rainer, pass, um, oh, Brett Q took himself out early, but, um, gets all the way up front and he cannot track down Piranha and Piranha's on the 500. Just little dude, just sending it, just sending it, have not even run practice, just, going. <laughs> and Kate up got to the end. He goes, what are you doing with your life? You could, you could be something. And Piranha's yeah. like, but you know what? He goes, I went the racing route for a bit and it was so much work and so hard. I didn't have any friends. He goes, I come here and he goes, yeah, I'm 
you know, in the, the realm of what people say, this is accomplishment and this is yeah. not accomplishing quote unquote success, success. Yeah. He's like, I am with my friends every day. He goes, I get to fly around the world and help contribute either, you know, behind the scenes. He came on for a year as mechanic. Um, he was on the first nitro tour. He was just contraption guy. He had a couple, um, you know, no one really knew who he was, but he was always the guy helping out yeah. and he never really got paid a dime. He's, he's, spent all his own money getting on tour and doing this stuff. And, you know, now he's actually getting to be on the tour and, uh, and riding in it, which is, is pretty one cool. of the dudes. Yeah. So I think that like to go back to the very start, you talk about like Kelly Slater, Tom Brady, like they've all got championships and stuff and what they've done is like undeniable. But I just think that the economy of Travis Pastrana and what you've created for other people that you really care about. So like the Harry, Harry Binks, the Piranhas, the Dusties, the, all of these people that essentially have like, you guys are uncommon people that <laughs> are not fit to be in society. No. Like, you know, like, and, 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 and that's a compliment. Yeah, you know I, I took I mean? those compliments. It's yeah. like, you guys aren't fit for the normal shit. Like this isn't, this box is not where you guys should be fucking sitting a hundred percent. But then it's like through what you did, you created this whole new box. And then that box is like this positive thing that it empowers people in the stands It like people watching the movie, you know what I mean? So it's like, I think like fuck the championships in a way, like what you created through this movement is just, it's, re- it's really powerful. And for Harry, like when he was on the podcast, he was legitimately like, dude, I had nothing else. All I wanted to do, I watched Travis Pastrana. I wanted to be <laughs> Travis Pastrana. So Harry's and like, the most humble guy in the world. Cause you got to think th- this guy, see like the, the guys in moto and honestly, a lot of the guys in BMX, um, they're, they're going to make it. You got X, you got all kinds of stuff, but there's what kind of to your point, this is something that says, Hey, if you're passionate about something, I don't care if it's scootering or pogo stick or whatever. <laughs> yeah, pogo Fred first tour. <laughs> if you really just love what you do and you want to push it and you want to be able to travel the world with a bunch of people that are going to not just help you, but just motivate you, just be yeah. there and encourage you to do really dumb things. It's a, it's a horrible short, uh, it's high risk, low pay, Yeah. but you have that opportunity to really live life. Yeah. And I just, this, this crew that we got together, everyone says, how can you take your kids out there on tour all the time? I'm like, are you kidding me? They, that's they like get the home. family. Yeah. They get home and they're like, you know, six o'clock in the morning. They're like, well, where's Harry? Where, what are we doing? We're yeah. going to the gym. <laughs> we, we hanging out. Well, that's like Harry said that when he comes off tour, he has this like really weird adjustment to normal life because he's used to call time at the hotel lobby. And then he's like, he said, sometimes he, he psychs himself up to go to the lobby because he knows there's some fucking gnarly shit about to go down. Like whether it's on the way to the show, whether it's like in the bar after, whether it's like, it's a, f- a lifestyle of people that are just going for it. And you pick and choose your battles, but doesn't matter what we're doing. I mean, you can play playing tic-tac-toe and somehow it gets completely out of hand. All right. Loser's got to go jump that 150 foot bridge over there. Shoot. I, it's into the rapids. Yeah. Yeah. No, we checked it. It's fine. You can do it. <laughs> yeah. You'll be, yeah, no, you can. If you say you're going to do anything in this crew, yep. you, you have to do it. So that's be very careful. Like so many new guys come in, just talking so much smack. Yeah. And if they back it up, they stay. If not, it's <laughs> the you. quickest way to get out of there. Dude, that was like uh, Dusty's mini flip at Biflo. Mm-hmm. Was like, well, he didn't even want to do that. <laughs> that was like, he that said, was you said. No, he goes, oh, you know what? I think one day I might want to try this. <laughs> Here's a bike. One day the camera's is right up. <laughs> and then that was like the that was like a mini maxi flip. How high he sent that thing. It was like your you did yours. It was like bro perfect textbook mini flip and then you just see Dusty we are 35 feet in the air and he ne- he said he'd never even flip the big bike no well, he, that's untrue he front flipped one and Dusty hates the foam pit his first time ever in the foam pit he bailed off the bike it landed on him it broke his uh, broke his foot mm. but like pretty bad and he had to do the whole tour with a broken foot um, second time he was in he does a front flip his first front flip on a dirt bike. First time ever hitting 75 feet. I was like, Dusty, it's, if you do exactly like you do on a BMX bike, um, it'll come around like that. Basically the kicker that we have is like hitting a curb at the top. It just helps the bike start. Yeah, it does the little, but you still got to 
I mean, you still, it's still hard to get a front flip around. Um, and he just went up there and full on chucked it. And he was like, Oh no, he bails off and he ends up in a Superman. He looks through spots it, pulls it around, not no flip levers or anything and goes to where he would have landed it perfect to the backside and on his first ever go, but smashes his nuts oh. so hard and then gets buried in the foam pit. He's like, I'm never doing that again. Let's go. Let's go to dirt. So his first ever 75 foot jump on a full size bike to dirt oh. was a front flip. And he lawn darted it full like he does on his mountain bike, just stuck his head straight out. He's like, yeah, I feel more comfortable like that. I'm like, great. But as we were coming to the ramp, he goes, stop, stop. How fast do you hit it? I'm like, this is all stuff you're supposed to figure out. We, didn't even, we didn't even measure how far you went. So that's kind of the crew we got. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely a heavy environment. And then you add in winner's win, which is like, that takes it to a whole new level. So like explain that concept for people that want to maybe fuck with their friends forever. Yeah. Well, the beauty of winner's win is I feel like with almost every other person or every other group I've ever met in the world, when there's like, you know, 150, 250 foot, whatever the jump is that you're doing or trick or whatever, you know, if there's a couple of guys that think they might be doing it, you rock, paper, scissors to see who doesn't have to do it. Mm. Well, ours, cause that's the glory that is, you know, okay. The first guy to do it has the highest chance of injury and the lowest chance of making the film. So, you know, he'll just as a crash, but as soon as the first guy jumps a big jump or does a trick, you kind of, it's the three minutes. A mile. Well, yeah, you Every, exactly. Right. You're like yeah, we got yeah, four minute, but yeah, minute mile. we don't thing. do miles. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. cool. Three minute kilometer. Right? Yeah, Can I do that? Yeah, well, yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so they, um, yeah, so we reverse it and say, okay, it's like, um, you know, I think special Greg actually started this. We're jumping building to building, um, almost 70 stories in the air. So like 700 feet, you could base jump this easily. Um, no safety nets, nothing. And we're on little kids toys and we build out of scrap wood, this roll in and we're like this old piece of junk, big wheel that we bought for toys R us for like 60 bucks. And we're looking and we're like, all right, if the wheels break, if the ramp doesn't work, if anything happens, like you are just going to die. So there's you, no, you, yeah. well, you have like, you know, 10 seconds of free fall before you die. Yeah, so yeah. you think about your life, get a quick tweet out. Yeah, probably. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's gnarly. And so everyone's sitting around and I'm like, all right, rock, paper, scissors. And my only, only person that stepped up was special Greg. He goes, all right, I'm in. And then he won rock, paper, scissors. So I was like, all right, I got to go. He's like, no, he goes, I just won the right to be able to be the first person to ever send a gap 70 stories in the air. He goes, I'm going, I'm like, what, why do we play? And it just clicked. And like in this culture, if you win, you get the right to be the most badass guy there. Yeah. And it's, it's a horrible thing. Cause when you win, you're like, yes, I get to go first shit. I'm probably going to die. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that concept that, that was where I got introduced to it was two stroke week and we were playing big buck hunter and I got last in every single thing. So I, you are was going like, up against some, some, some world, heavy, heavy yeah. hitters. <laughs> that, there was like the bottle of uh, the poison you had to drink at the end of yeah. it. And then I was like, fuck, I'm going to have to drink this poison every single time. <laughs> and I turned out, I was like, wait, being totally shit at this has actually really worked in my favor. Cause life winners win. Yeah. It'll prolong your life expectancy. If you're really bad at rock, paper, scissors, where, where did the competitive side of you come from? Because it's hardcore the way that you're, the way that you're geared and why there's some real issues with, with that competition. Well, my dad was Marine. Um, I, so did, I didn't know that at all. He was a drill sergeant in the Marine Corps. No, sh- oh, doing, well, there it is. <laughs> doing pushups. What you looking at boy? Your mama down there. Your mama ain't down there. <laughs> like, like, all right. He's just uh, like hell week every week. Yeah, for Travis every, yeah. So like weekends as a kid, um, you know, if, if I ever slept past, I could usually get away with seven thirty. ever past eight. I just got woken up like pretty much getting beat, but you know, in, in a positive way. Yeah. Um, so fourth grade, I was like, you know, told my parents, I'm like, I really, really want to go down to Florida, Ernesto Fonseca, Ricky Carmichael, Matt Walker. Like at the time, all the, the Shea Bentley, the top motocross guys, yeah. um, all went to Florida and my dad goes, all right, you keep on a roll you know, A's and B's, um, you know, whatever, 85% and higher on, on all your schoolwork. Not one test is an honor roll. I don't care if it's music, whatever it is. And you run one mile 
before. So fourth grade, you run one mile um, before school every day. Miles not long. He goes, I don't care how fast you do it. He goes, I don't care if it's snowing. I don't care if it's a hundred degrees outside. I don't care if you're sick. You get all your homework done. You get A's and B's and you're on one mile. And he goes, if you do that, your uncles and I will basically figure out a way. I mean, my dad made $40,000 a year. My yeah. mom was a, started being a flight attendant when I started racing just so we could be able to travel just have that a little bit extra. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and free flights to, to get me to travel uh, different places. And, um, you know, the whole family, my uncles all basically took part of their paycheck to pay for gas, um, for us to get, you know, the truck to, to the nationals and stuff. And it was a really family thing. And my dad goes, look, he sold his Harley. Um, we ended up selling the boat by the time I was 10 and he's like, look, you'll never make it in any sport. He goes, your uncle was the best athlete that's ever come out of Annapolis. Probably the best athlete that's ever come out of Maryland. He was quarterback for the Denver Broncos. Um, he got knocked out by, um, Hightower from police Academy. Um, oh, really? and, yeah, before the playoffs and whatever. And, um, he said, he's still back here working construction with us in the summer. Um, and he is, uh, basically didn't make enough to, to make, make a living. Yeah. So he goes, but if you stay motivated in your school in school and you learn work ethic and your body and, um, everything he goes, we will do everything we can to get you to the track, but have no illusion about it. You will never make a living doing this stuff, but every day that you can do what you love for a living, ride that train until the wheels fall off. Yeah. And thank you, dad. The wheels still have not fallen off, but I've used that mentality when everyone said, Oh, um, you should stick to racing. And I'm like, you know, my heart's in freestyle. And dad's like, well, you know, follow your heart. Cause if, if you love it, it's worth it. If you don't love it, my uncle Alan he had so many concussions, changed his personality, his shoulders, his knees, everything shot. And he teaches health now at community college and he's got his body back. Okay. But he's 65 or you know almost 70 now. And he's, if he didn't work out every single day, he'd be struggling. Pot, and yeah. that's, but you know, and that's, that's the risk you pay and for, for what you do. So he said, look, if it's, it's not worth it to take this risk and to possibly paralyze or possibly kill yourself, if it's not everything you, you want to do. So go have fun, do freestyle. You know what? You might make it a year or two and you'll be back working construction because the family construction company and that worked out. And then I, I started going, you know what? I've, I've done everything I really want to do in freestyle, at least as far as the events. Yeah. Um, I really want to try cars. And I was like, well, there you go. There goes your savings. And, but if that's what you're really passionate about, and I put almost every dime I made from motocross. You ton of na in NASCAR, right? Yeah. Well, that was <laughs> planned. Yeah. Everything worked until NASCAR for fucking turn and <laughs> left. But, uh, no, so rally, I put in pretty much everything that I made up until, you know, I was 19 years old into my first two years of rally. I mean, I bought a car thinking, Oh yeah, I'm going to practice. Like I do motocross. So I bought a car for $120,000 and sold it two weeks later for 20 and thought, okay, I'm not practicing. Uh, <laughs> I don't have Is that for real. Yeah. I just, well, cause I figured you could just practice every day, but you, you only get to practice at the races. Yeah. And you, you know, anyway, this is a long story. So yeah. I got Colin McRae rally and I listened to notes and played video games. That was my, <laughs> not really the same as motocross, but, uh, no. So then did that for a while. And then nitro circus started picking up speed. So I went into that and then the ramps were just the same. And I'm like, man, the gigantic side, these guys have so much fun and everything's innovative. And that's when we started working with the triple flip and Josh Sheehan and yeah. all this stuff. And then we started working on airbags and then we invented the airbag lander and all this just rad stuff came around. And then re, re got you going, re got again. me going. Yeah. And I, I like to really hate my competition in nitro circus. I just, I like everyone so much and I can't really compete on that level. It's with those top guys, like once a year, twice a year, I might do something really dumb. Yeah. Like I just landed an Aussie roll. I hate that it's causing Aussie roll. You freaking Aussie steal everything. So what's the deal to explain the Aussie roll? It is a double backflip with a full twist. Uh, because you said, what's the math here? Yeah, no. So it's, yeah. it's, it basically comes down to nitro physics and this is a really long tangent for what I was getting on, but to the Aussie right. Hey, tangents are fun. There you go. We encourage tangents. tangents. Cheers. Cheers to tangents. So <laughs> there was a, a trick that we called the shit spin because basically I hucked as hard as I could and then just it's through shit at the fan and trying to get back to the wheels. And every now and then it would work. Um, I had two of my biggest ankle injuries. Um, I actually shit myself on landing at X games, um, and got up and went in front of Cam Sinclair. It wasn't even going to count. And I tried it again and shattered my ankle in 40 places. Oh. Um, I couldn't get out of bed for two months, like bedpan felt bad for my wife horrible, horrible scenario there. Um, and then I was six months before I could walk, um, eight months before I could really do anything. And my ankle's still just, it's a club. Yeah. Um, and that's from the shit spin. Other words known as the TP roll. Yeah. Um, the worst trick ever named 
after myself kind of. So yeah. whatever, I'll take it. Um, so how did it turn into the Aussie roll? Well, if you pull back as hard as you can and you twist as hard as you can on a dirt bike, you get one full flip and one half a spin. And I'm like, so every time I'm going around, I'm doing a backflip 180 and I'm coming and the bike starts into a front flip. So to keep that front flip, I'm like, I either land yeah, yeah, 90 yeah. short or I land on my back. Yeah. And one time I just threw it and I landed a little past my back and I'm like, all I need is time. I'm like, if Josh Sheehan can do a triple backflip, I can sure as shit do a double backflip with the full twist. Cause the twist kind of happens at the same time as the flip. I'm like, you don't need to go. Josh went hundred feet in the air. And as it turns out, I was kind of correct. I went about 75 feet in the air. So you need about 25 foot less, <laughs> less height to get the Aussie roll on a dirt bike. And a scooter kid back in like 2011 from Australia was the first person to land a double backflip 360 and he called it an Aussie roll. And anyway, I'm waiting on Brandon Schmidt to land a triple backflip 360 and he's going to call it American roll. And no one steal that unless you're an American and you better call it American roll. The race is on. <laughs> Shit. When I wanted to talk about, we're probably just going to jump like all over, but there's just a million things to talk about. Oh, here, let me get back to So yeah. Where do we, where do we leave off? Well, just here, back to that tangent that if anyone's still following this podcast, God bless you. So no, trust me, we look at our analytics, the average device time is two hours and 58 minutes. So we're good. Oh yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. People listen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you go, um, basically my dad's like, look, you're probably gonna end up construction with the family. He has uh, five brothers and they all do construction. They're all still working you know, construction. That's what they do. That's what all of our friends do. Most, and everyone who went to college just went to for sport and then went yeah. back to construction or they went to the military and then they came back to construction. All of my rally team, they all went to the military, worked on helicopters and stuff, and then came back to either work in rally or construction. Yeah. So really my future was going to be construction, which nothing wrong with construction, but my dad goes, go for it. Take every second you can. So, but he goes, make sure you're having fun. Cause if you're not having fun, it's not worth the risk. He goes, even cars, you know, people die racing cars. They, you know, Dale, Dale Earnhardt, uh, yeah. you know, he, one of the, at the time prime of Colin. everything, Colin McRae. I mean, well, Colin died in a helicopter crash, but yeah, people oh, die. Yeah. So at the end of the day, he said, look, enjoy every day to this fullest and, but work your ass off. He goes, if you're ever not working your ass off, are you? our family will not support you. By turn 16 was able to sign a pro contract and luckily didn't need, um, the family was able to repay them in Bobcats and stuff that helped their, their work. Yeah. I stole everything along the way and broke everything of everybody's. Um, so went into free, went into racing, found more passion in freestyle, went to freestyle. And then I was like, it's the high, the risk is not worth the reward for me anymore. I don't feel like I have, I'm defending a title as opposed to trying, trying to, to get something to gain something. So I said, okay, let's go into rally cars and put every dime that I made in motocross, um, you know, into racing cars and learning. And Colin McRae took me under his wing and Niall McShay and basically all those guys over there on that Island, um, <laughs> yeah. taught me how to rally because, um, all the top us guys go to NASCAR. But after four consecutive, um, us national championships, I said, all right, do I go to the, the world rally championship? Um, or, and Subaru had just dropped out of that point who was kind of Subaru was yeah, my main that's right. brand. I'm like, well, shoot, that doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to switch brands and then move to Europe when I have nitro circus and all yeah. my friends back here. I said, let's try NASCAR. I didn't know shit about NASCAR. I was like Tom Cruise in days of thunder and put me in the car. I could, I could drive. So, yeah. so I drove. <laughs> Learned so much about it. Actually enjoy that sport so much more than I ever thought I would. And if I was better, I would still be in that sport. Yeah. Um, but as it turns out, I suck at turning left. My true uh, talent, if you will, is analyzing risk and being able to take more risk than anyone else in the track. But if everyone on the track still driving 200 miles an hour is not afraid of dying, they got safer barriers in the walls and they've got such good harnesses and systems and Hans, you can't see shit in the car. Yeah. It's literally 130 degrees. You lose 17 pounds from when you step in the car to when you get out. Everyone says, where do you pee? I'm like, you don't pee. You sweat everything through your body. Yeah. You have to pee. Your body just recycles it yeah. back in. Just give me some, anything you got. Um, so NASCAR had so many challenges I didn't expect. Um, such a good group of just good old boys and so much fun. Um, but again, put in a lot of my money to I said, our money now, cause I was with Lindsay and yeah. had two kids and I said, okay, like I'm battling guys that are up and comers like Kyle Larson and, um, Chase Elliott, who are now kind of top of sport. But I'm like, these guys are racing literally 150 events a year. Yeah. That's like 
basically that's their life five the days a week yeah. they're racing or testing in a vehicle i'm like i'm not willing to do and they're already better than me and they're 15 or 16 years old yeah you know i'm like i'm not willing to do that again to start at the bottom again to learn this whole sport and um right at that time we started working on these landing bags with uh, mm. um, yeah, basically the new airbag system with bag jump. And I started getting in. That's what took over my whole mindset of let's see if we can land this triple backflip. And by we, I mean, Sheeny, um, <laughs> you know, and it just kind of evolved from there. So sorry to talk so long on that tangent, no, but, no. but so I got back into nitro circus and then for the last three years I've, dabbled with rally still just to keep my foot in the door and then was able to win the U S championship again, um, last year. So I'm the current North America rally champion. Number one son. But I, I but I beat and it, lucky, like, uh, my mentor, my coach, the guy that I've looked up to my whole life, David Higgins, um, him and his brother, Mark are two of the greatest drivers of all time. And he was the guy that kind of helped me through everything and beat him on, I mean, I did beat him in the championship, but I only flat out beat him one race. Yeah. I got lucky, but I, I feel like I played enough mind games and I completely was an asshole the entire year. And God, I love hating my competition and just pissing him off the whole way. And we're still kind of friends now, David. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love you, man. I really I have so much respect for him. And he's such a great driver and such a he I would have never been even close to him without his help all the way through. Um, but we were able to we tied in the amount of uh, race wins. We tied in our worst race finish, um, for the throwout race. Um, we were tied with three stages to go in basically the, the other tiebreaker on, on points. Like we had a chance to tie on every stage, every, everything, like all the tiebreakers all the way through. So you just rock, paper, scissors and wizard winners win. Well, obviously <laughs> winners win. <laughs> no, nah, so it was good. Anyway, long story long, um, won the championship. So, but for me, rally, I can take risk and make time. Yeah. You, you gotta be calculated. Cause that's kind of a moto thing too. Like you can just send it down the hill, outbreak the guy. It's going to be sketchy, but you can pull it off kind of thing. You usually pull it off. And with rally, it's kind of the same deal. You need to know when you can and when you can't, you're not going to make huge time in moto. You shift up to fourth on a 450. You go come out of that corner, mm. hot wheelie in and just try to wheelie all the way across the whoop section. You're going to make a second right there. Yep. Uh, where rally, if you can make a half second, a mile, that was huge. Yeah. That's intense to have that kind of, um, like you see it even just for the average person. Like if you go with like a really good group of mates to a oh, just yeah. good go-kart place and you're just split in tents and there's like, there's those tents that you're trying to get and everyone's doing it. So it's like times that by, like you said, half a second over a mile in a crazy car with just all the conditions, you know, our championship for the North America rally championship, the ARA championship last year came down to really, we had two super special stages, uh, but they're generally went in my favor. Just, I, I like that race of champion kind of short course kind of stuff. Yep. Um, David, his, thing. He needed to win that stage basically to win the championship. If he won that one, he probably would have won the championship. Um, so it came down to this last, uh, 12 mile stage. Um, it was raining. So he's from the Isle of man. He lives in Wales. It rains all the time. I mean, I'm East coast. It rains, but I was like, Oh shit, but not forever. Yeah. Why? <laughs> um, yeah. So we went in the final stage and I beat him by two tenths of a second. So in the mud, in the rain, all the mistakes, all the corners, all the everything, two tenths of a second separated that entire championship. So when people are like, oh yeah, I could do NASCAR. I'm only like three seconds off my first run. I'm like, that's like street bike Tommy. I'm, it's the funniest thing. Tommy thinks he can drive and he's like, <laughs> I'm the best driver. I don't, I don't drift well. I'm like, what do you think race car driving is? Everyone can- Controlling a drift. <laughs> you got it. Like <clears throat> Bristol, Tennessee, coolest track ever. I hate that track now that I've raced it because it's, it's like a gladiator arena and you drop in and it's wild because the top of the banking, you're four stories up. So you don't think about it, but you drop into the bottom and the car has no, like you just, you're on the wind. It's like a free fall until kind of you thing. hit the, yeah. you like literally land. Everyone says you land. It doesn't look like it on TV, but I land and I'm like, and I'm sliding all the way around and uh, Trevor Bain drives around the outside of me. And I was like, what the hell? We're in the same, we're, we're both Roush, both Fords. Like, what did you do? He's like, well, how's your car? I was like, dude, I'm, I might be a little loose. I slid all the way around the corner. He's like, all four wheels are just two. I was like, two? He's like, well, that's your problem. You're not utilizing all the, all the traction that you can. You gotta, you gotta adjust the car. I'm like, it, TV, it looks like you guys just drive around in circles. Yeah. Dude. But that's what Tommy thinks. And he's like, ah, well, I'm good until it starts sliding. And then I just lose control. I'm like... It's everything. That's, that's, that's all you, of it. You don't even drive. <laughs> Dude, I, I, uh, 
I was a full NASCAR hater. I was just like, man, this stuff is so lame. And then I went to Daytona for the Supercross and then I'm walking out of the infield and I'm just going, oh, oh, this is why. That's, ah, oh, okay, cool. My bad. And then I just walked off going like, fuck, I like really want to watch a NASCAR now. Cause it is until, I don't think that like the TV obviously doesn't do it justice, which is so many sports. You but gotta like, go around right to the to front, sit. 200 miles an hour. Like, whoa. And sitting down in like at the bottom of that circuit and looking up, like you said, four stories. I'm like, how do they even make that? let alone drive around it that fast. So Daytona is three lanes wide. Like if you're taking car lanes, like down the street yeah. and multiple times the cars go four wide. So just take your average three lane road and then put four cars in it. Now here's the kicker and you can't see us from TV because they put the stupid cameras on top of the car, but you can't see over top of the car in front of you. Yeah. Um, of the, so you're going down and all you can see, you're pushing the car in front of you and you can't see the cars beside you because you got these, uh, like Hans and harnesses. So you can see only what's out here. So you can't see if a car's straight beside you, you can't tell. And that if a car's passing you on the right, like their lanes going a little faster, it sucks the whole car around. Oh. So you're relying on your spotter. If he says, you know, uh, door basically means that someone's on your door. So at three degrees of y'all, which means the car's just stepped out three, like barely at all. Yeah. You have 800 pounds of side force at 190 miles an hour. So picture you're doing a bench press and someone puts their pinky on when you can't quite. So you're drifting the car around the corner and then someone takes a little bit of that side force out. Or if they're all the way on your door, you still can't see them. It's all gone. So I crashed so many people the first time and everyone's giving me the finger and flip me off and throwing their helmets at me. I'm like, I didn't even touch you. <laughs> they're like, dude, you took the wind off my outside corner. No shit. Anyway, I all new to me. So it was, it was really cool. But uh, Daytona. So you're going down 200 miles an hour and there's a little thing that says Sunoco. It so says what? Sunoco. It's a gas company. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's right where the track starts to turn. So you're 200 miles an hour. You're four wide. And the guy tells you you're four wide. And you're trying to think, all right, four wide, second from the top. So you're like, I have to leave exactly one car length here. And I probably have a couple inches on my right and a couple inches on my left. I can't see any other cars. And I can't see in front of my, my hood. And you're, you're trying to drive perfectly in this, this area. And you look up. And the second you see the Sunoco sign, you start turning the wheel in. And you drop. And if you're on the top, you're, you're actually dropping and sliding and like the whole car sliding and everyone does it in unison. And if one jackass doesn't <laughs> see the Sunoco sign or turns or his cars pushes or slides more than anyone else's, it's a pile Game up. over. It's so much fun. Dude. Yeah. Like I had just from, I didn't even know that side of it, but just from seeing it, I was just blown away of like, whoa, this is actually, I could see why this is hard. Because it's like, and Ricky said the same thing. Like Ricky's like, dude, it's impossible. It's like the hardest thing you could, you could do like the way. Yeah. Just the nuances and the details. And it looks so simple, but I guess that's probably what makes it so, so hard, hard is because it is what's well, like, it's like, Oh, NASCAR. Okay. Just here's a sheet of paper. Here's a pencil, draw a perfect circle. Oh, you can't. Yeah. That's what we're doing. It's interesting though, because Jimmy Johnson, great driver, but I mean, if you look at most of the V8 supercar guys, or you look at mm. even your rally guys, or you, you'd be like, you know what? Jimmy is a solid professional race car driver. The best? Absolutely not. But Jimmy is the most calculated. He's the smartest guy that I've ever met. He's the one willing to work. He watches the in-car that he watches from, he doesn't just watch in-car of a race. He watches, or, you know, a race footage. He watches every single person's in-car and then knows exactly what they did to change their car. So he knows every temperature, every, him and his crew chief sit down and they know if the cloud cover comes over, what they're going to do to the car to change it, to make it just a little bit better than the next person. And they, it's really, it comes down to a smart person's sense of rally. But if you look at it, everyone's within three to four tenths of a second per lap. Yep. Best guy to worst guy on the track. You got a hundred guys that can drive that, but these guys are not just the best drivers or the smartest drivers. Do you think that NASCAR does a good enough job of getting this shit across? Because, or is it the fact that without sounding like a dick, the fan base doesn't care? Is it, do you like, what is it? Because I think that if you broke it down to like, if everybody knew just what was going on and they really tried to show it street bike, Tommy knows everything that I just told you. He was at half the races trying to steal cars, literally 
literally out of people's rigs to take out there, convinced that he was going to be two seconds faster than anyone on the track, that he was just going to magically be able to God do NASCAR. Bless street bike, tell me. <laughs> you got to love the enthusiasm. But that is what everyone, Monday morning quarterbacks, everyone yeah. that watches a motocross are like, oh, if I was, that's what I always said. I'm like, man, when I turn pro, I'm going to be the most fit guy. Well, you don't think that the first race you break your ankle. Yeah. Okay. You keep riding. You don't tell anyone because Carmichael will step on it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not to be an asshole that I'd step on it too. Like you, you know where your weakness are of your opponents and you go after it. That's just how racing works. So you're a bunch of assholes trying to win, Yeah. do whatever it takes. You know, you have a drink in the, the pub later and whatever, but um, you know, it's, you go out there to be the best. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, no one understands what goes into it. And everyone thinks, yeah. Oh, if I had an opportunity, you look at Josh Sheehan, he worked the mines, right. Yeah. To be able to pay, to build his own ramp where he didn't have a foam pit. He went to the desert, fluffed up the landing with some shovels, him and his mates dropped the ramp and he just started learning how to do a backflip. Uh, that's the same story of almost every one of us that did a backflip. None of, I mean, most of the guys yeah. that I know before foam pits came out or airbags or anything else, we were learning backflips. And I have so many parents that come up to me and say, Oh, if my kid had a chance, he, he would be the best in the world. No, you do have a chance. You got a dirt bike and you can flip it. Yeah. And even, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, some of my friends uh, from out West, they just went and one guy started working a fencing company and his buddy started working at um, basically a a mattress company. And every time they had old foam, um, you know, it took them six months to fill the entire thing. It was old mattress. It wasn't the best. It was a little flammable, but um, (laughs) there is one buddy built out of spare stuff, a fence all the way around the outside. And they got just basically, they welded together uh, some metal and they got a little cable and um, you know, they used a truck and they just backed the truck up and picked the guy out. And that was for free. I mean, but relatively speaking, they had to get jobs for six months. Like it's, it's when you want, when you want something bad enough, you'll make it happen. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's what's missing in, you know, everyone said off like piranha gets all the time. If I had what you had, I'm like, dude, he didn't have anything. Mm. You know, he's literally, this is, if, if you're passionate about something, you'll find a way. Yeah, for sure. Um, when I, I like was always curious because you're, you're a nice person, like genuinely a good, Thanks, man. Yeah, but there's, there's that competition side, right? Oh no, I'm a complete asshole. Yeah. And I wondered that when Deegan was doing what, like you and Deegan were like the two dudes back in the day for the freestyle side of things. And he represented everything that you didn't in a way, like, I guess like culturally you could say, or oh, like, 100%. you know, and like, but he, that was how he made his money. And this was how you made your money in a way. And it's like, Deegan's not a dick at all. Like he's actually a super nice dude. Super smart dude. Yeah. Really smart dude as well. But what was it like going to, like, was there a legit rivalry against you two or were you guys actually like trying to help each other in the progression of it? Or was it like, nah, man, I want to win this X games. Cause that was like a heavy time in freestyle. Oh, it truly was. And, and to be perfectly honest, I didn't like, I went through most of my career completely naive. I was just being me. Yeah. Never thought about image. Never. Everyone else is like, Oh, let me try to get a magazine shoot here. Dude. Dude. I hated press. I hated anything. I just wanted to ride my dirt bike. Yeah. And because the perennial of perennial grom. Yeah. Just like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, like, I just really want to go out there and ride. But Deegan was like, all right, how, I'm not quite good enough at racing. He's good. I mean, he, he, the race that he won, he beat, uh, was Rob, yeah, that was Car- yeah. Ricky Carmichael, Robbie Raynard, uh, uh Villaman, um, yeah, Pingree, uh, Wyndham. Yeah. K Dub was in there. K-Dub, K-Dub, yeah. Yeah, second, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like hey, Deegan was good yeah. like, without a doubt, but that was his only win. I mean, but he was, he was among the top guys, but he goes, okay, I'm not going to make a living doing this. He saw freestyle come around. And he goes, all right, what do people want to see? Why is skate doing so good? Why is snow doing so good? And he actually looked at it as a business perspective. So he has this metal militia, total world domination, yeah. all this stuff. And I didn't get it at the time, but it was funny because he was calling me a sellout. Oh, look at this sellout. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thumbs up. Goody two shoes, straight A student. When he was really the sellout, he was the one trying to make him money and I was just the one having fun. So it was a little confusing, but without Brian, I wouldn't have been nearly, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Cause it was the fuel, right? Like, yeah. And he was this, he figured that out and he like, we never, it was never spoken, but it was probably until my mid twenties before I understood how valuable what Brian Deegan was doing was not just for me, but the entire sport. Yeah. So like him, hate him. You knew who he was. 
And you either, I, I had people come up to me every, I had people trying to fight me before every, I'm like 17 years old. I'm like, what, why are you trying to fight me? And that would, Deacon would go out and he, he was so smart. And this is something I don't recommend, but like he went out and picked a fight with the police officer the night before, like a bar fight the night before the gravity games. Cause he went and told everyone he had all these tricks and he was going to dominate. And all the press was Brian oh. Deegan and these, these tricks that he's coming up with. Oh, he's not showing anyone there. He's going to, oh, it's, and I'm like, where I'm like, oh man, what's he got? What's he got? No, his whole plan was to build it all up. And then the whole announcement was not about me winning the gravity games was about Brian Deegan, the man keeping him down. He was just keeping it real man, partying with his friends. And yeah. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. But at the end of the day, that helped. I mean, you gotta think it used to be the flying Hawaiian Clifford Adam Tante, yeah. mad Mike Jones, cowboy, Kenny Bartram. Yeah. Everybody had the stick. Yeah. And then it got big enough where no one needed the stick. And then you got like, Nate Adams, who yeah. came out, who just wanted to be the best. But by pointing your toes and being so flawless, it made it look easy. Like Mad Mike Jones, he only did two or three tricks, but you thought he was going to die on every single every one of them. Every single time. So it's totally worth watching. <laughs> it's like Roger Maddow does something completely amazing. But Robbie Knievel, if he's on a different channel doing, you know, a hundred foot jump, I'm like, dude, I'll, I'm tuning I'll, in. I'll tune it yeah. in. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, I always, I like, I wondered from like, because obviously like meeting you and then meeting Deegan, like the first time I went to his house um, was just like randomly when he had that super cross track there when Speed and Style was oh, there. Yeah. And then I went with Cade Mozig and we hung out. Do you know Cade? Yeah. No, yeah. That's, that's funny. I was like, all right, that's cool. Yeah. So I went with Cade and Hanny actually. Oh, and shit. And we were like, <laughs> we were doing some filming around there and fucking around. And then I met Deegan and I kind of had this image of him in my head. Like that's how well he played the character. And then it's like this super nice guy comes up. He's like, hey man, where are you from? I love Australia. We did the Krusty Tour, blah, blah. And I'm just like, and I was like kind of intimidated or not, not for like the star value, but just like, fuck, is this dude like going to be an asshole? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like a kid. And then I'm like, wait a minute. You're the same as Travis Pastrana. <laughs> like you motherfucker. You got me. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you, you sly little rascal. But, no, I just and he, but like, he definitely, like he still was the party guy. I mean, he definitely like, he was way, he, he, bit of it, yeah. he did. He, and he was, he was pretty hardcore dude. Um, you know, I think his kids definitely. Mellowed you know, him out a bit. Yeah. And his daughter's racing. NASCAR. Um, she's 16 years old. She's crushing she's like it. Super good, dude. His uh, son, what well, his oldest son, is already doing backflips. He's on like 80, like little girl. Danger boy. Yeah. How the crazy is the marketing that he's doing with him too? Like Danger Boy Deegan. He's one. So he's got the skills to back it up. But he's got this. That's the thing. Like everyone has the skills. You can. Everyone's like, oh, and I feel bad almost for the kids. It's like Tony Hawk's kids coming coming around. You know, like Lynn, yeah. my wife grew up with a lot of Tony's uh, his boys, yeah. and they were like, oh, if you won, well, of course he one. He's, he's Tony's kid. Yeah, if he didn't, a, well, yep. why didn't he win? He has everything. So uh, they're going to have to overcome that. But I, I honestly, I think Haley um, and Danger Boy will probably be bigger if they can have the talent stay to back the it course, up. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and obviously stay the course, but they definitely have the smarts, that family, they're, they're smart people. Yeah. And yeah, it was just interesting to, to see like, cause that was the rivalry, but man, it was like, you two were the guys that kind of almost like, I'm going to say propped it up in for all of action sports. But I think like, you know, you had the skaters and the BMX, but you and Deegan doing that whole thing. And it's just like that. It was a perfect storm of this image of the clean cut, all American kid. And then the all American badass. Yeah. And you were doing the same stuff. And it, you know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a crazy piece of, of let's like just general sport history. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but he, and he was that general badass, but he was also very smart about smart, it. Yeah. And yeah, he came up to me at one point. He's like, Hey, cause he'd always come up and be like, you know, Hey, Miss Pastrana, how you doing? Which always threw me for loop. I'm like, all right, this is mind games. He's fucking with me right now. <laughs> <laughs> like for sure. Or like afterwards he'd be like, Oh man, Hey, that was a really cool trick. I'm like, oh, you doing it? I'm so confused. Yeah. But then all right, off. Gosh, I'm so bad at tangents, but I think it's your fault. Anyway, so they, um, <laughs> do we need another one? Probably, but Rick, Rick Dog, can we please get another one? Oh, you're the, you're the best. I love pod podcast producer. <laughs> She's a legend. <laughs> for the boys. <laughs> oh man. I don't even know where I was going with that, but yeah, he was being nice to you saying, no. So yeah, the, Brian was being, he was completely nice, um, about everything and like, oh yeah, let's, you know, 
we should go ride or we should do this. And I'm like, dude, like I, I don't even have friends in, in motor. I have acquaintances. Yeah. Dude, Christmas, all the test tracks, like Christmas morning when, you know, people should be like with their families and stuff. No, we're with our acquaintances who happen to be on the same team Yeah, on the test track, not even thinking about it on New Year's. No way we're staying up, you know, until the, the ball drops or whatever. Yep. Maybe if we were on the West Coast, you know, it's uh, mm. nine o'clock. But, um, you know, these racers are, they're tough. They're the toughest. I honestly think it's the toughest sport as far as physically, mentally, yeah, everything that you could possibly do. And the freestylers are kind of the opposite. They just, they embrace life. They have so much fun. It's like two completely different worlds. And it was so hard for me coming from a military Marine Corps drill sergeant, yeah. um, racing, winnings, everything, knock down your grandma on the last corner. If that's what it takes to win, <laughs> hate your competition, um, you know, on the track. And then my dad always did good. Like whatever happens on the track stays on the track. Yeah. Um, which it's funny because a lot of people don't do it that way, but yeah, Chad Reed was awesome. Well, anyway, that's a whole different tangent, but Brian Deegan, the, the way that he did everything was super smart and helped build up the whole sport. Yeah. There was a, I was going somewhere with that, but oh well, whatever. No, I think, um, yeah, I just, I think it's one of those things too, that like in the moment you wouldn't have even seen it happening. And I don't think that anyone really saw the impact that was going to have. And I think it's when you look back, you're like, you, that was genius. Yeah. And that was, was such was a plan. That was, was a moment too. That, and like to recreate what you guys did and where you guys took everything. And like we saw, I guess we started like the legacy now that you've kind of created and it was giving a lot people. Thanks to Brian Deegan. Yeah. And it's just like that lightning in a bottle thing, man. Like the ramps got better. Kerry does a backflip. And then that's the four minute mile moment where everyone goes, yeah. damn, I'm doing that. So it's like, yeah, just, it was, it was such a crazy time for you to be involved in. And, and yeah, for you to say, thank you. Legend uh, for you to say that, um, now the beer just distracted me. Yeah. No, sorry. That yeah, you were like almost naive to it, and it's like this this whole grand grand plan gets almost laid out. And you're completely unaware, and all you had to do was be you, and that would and the and the world would be right. You know what I mean? Like that he, never he happens. Took, yeah, he, he took, took care of all of it, and then you just did you, just and it's be like you. Yeah, it's like bam. Oh shit, that was rad. But with with the um the stuff with your dad and that military background, did you enjoy the discipline? Like once you kind of got the ball rolling with that side of things, did you enjoy that? And the, the runs were easy and the training was easy in school. I mean, school is probably easy. Just could you were pretty switched on dude, but like, did you enjoy the regiment and the discipline that your dad sort of created for you? Um, because as a kid, it's pretty easy to resent that kind of, um, but it, regime in a way. It was really interesting because from the time I, my dad made it very known very early He's like, cause one of my friends, we were like 10 years old and he told his dad he went for a run. He ran around the corner and he stopped. And then someone saw him just like eating a popsicle around the corner, yeah. like waiting, you know, 20 minutes to pour some water on run back. My dad goes, I would be so happy if I ever found out you did that because he goes, we wouldn't go to Florida. We wouldn't go. He goes, yeah, look, it easy and my, for us. my yeah. mom is like, Hey, look, you can't turn pro until you finish high school. She goes, if you really, she was so against homeschooling, but this is, you know, fourth grade, she's telling me this. And this is, I mean, that's an early time for a kid, but she goes, look, you have to realize that we don't have the money to be putting in this. Your uncles, your family, like we can't afford dirt bikes. We really can't. We're going, you know, everyone else has motorhomes and trailers. We have, um, a pickup truck and we're a blow up mattress that we all camp out in, um, which is, was great. And they were happy to do it. Um, you know, but they said, look, you have to want to do this. And if you ever don't want to do it, don't feel any pressure from us. Mm. And like, this is just because you want to. So it wasn't, you know, my dad was probably the only one that had slowed down. It was Justin Bucklew and I were racing seven 11, um, championship down in uh, Gatorback, Florida. And my dad, we were both riding so far over our heads, like just like, going to eat shit. My dad. So Justin's dad's like, you can let go. And my dad's like, slow down. <laughs> so, so as much of a military guy as he was, he's like, work hard for everything you can. But dude, just he we're, sensible, do, we're yeah. doing this because you want to do it. Yeah. And he goes, the moment you say you don't want to do it. Great. We're going to try to, I'll work back my, I'll get a Harley. He goes, I loved on the weekends. I would do one day on a Harley with your mom and you little shit, you fucked that up for me. <laughs> and I do one day on the boat. Um, and that was his, what he did. And he goes, now we spend every weekend at the track and he goes, 
I am happy to do it and I will work. I mean, so we used to drive to Florida on the weekends, fourth grade. Um, how far is Florida from where you were at? 14 hours. Yep. So my dad would pick me up. He'd take off work early, pick me up at 3 PM when school got off. We drive, you know, 14 hours, you get there five, six o'clock in the morning, just in time to sign up race Saturday. He'd work on the bike all night, Saturday night, race Sunday, him and my mom would drive all, you know, all through the night. They dropped me off at, you know, nine o'clock in the morning when we got to, got to the school. And, you know, sometimes I was late, usually came in bruised, actually child services came in. We're like, why is this kid always bruised and so tired? Dad's like, I don't know why he's tired. He sleeps the whole damn time. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, like that, that commitment now is a, as a father of two girls, like it'd be scary for them to do and to get to that level and to do that, you know, Mm. what what we do. But if they're half as passionate as their mom is or Harry bank or any of the nitro guys or myself and what they do, I think we've done a good job as a parent. And yeah, I have so much respect for my parents for literally sacrificing everything that they had and not even my mom was always like, Oh, he's going to make it. My dad's like, every mom thinks that, Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. you know, we're doing this because you love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, like I, I raced motocross for like, I don't know. Yeah. Same sort of thing when I was a kid and we lived in Cairns, which is like rural, yeah. like you guys have done a show up there. Oh, yeah. So like we drove from Cairns to Brisbane every second week to do a racing Shh, series. That's a long way. Yeah. So like dad, same deal. Like we'd, you know, leave work early on a Friday afternoon, getting in, rock up, we'd wake up, get ready, practice, ride, drive home, school, same deal. Yeah. And I, th- I think it's that community, man. It's, it, it is like, and the, the, the bond that you build with your parents out of it, because I think that like true friendships and true, um, it's, I think that's why there's such a bond. It's a, obviously an over kind of not overreach over exaggeration of the situation, but like you find that like military guys are like brothers for life. And because when you're going through like something so hard and that person's like there next to you or you fall behind and they pick you up, then it's like, they're the people where you're like, Oh, that's like a real, that's a real thing. And it's not when you are dedicating your life to something and there's injuries and there's all the extra shit that comes along with being a motocross kid. I think that if, if you have that story and you don't have the spoiled, cause there's some spoiled little assholes out there that they don't have they, everything. They don't, they don't make it though, because yeah. the, at the end of the day, motocross is probably the toughest sport on the face of the earth. And if you don't truly want to be there, you can get good. It's like, you know, you can get pretty good at almost any sport, but at the top, yeah, dude, what gets the champions is the guys that really, really honestly and truly dedicate everything. Everyone says, Oh, you guys got paid really well. I'm like, dude, there's no amount of money. I don't care what anyone says. There's no amount of money that would make you work as hard as Ricky Carmichael worked or as hard as, as any Dungy or any of these champions. And they didn't work because of the money. Like they were able to work because they could take off of work and, and, and do it because of that. But what you don't see is the injuries and everyone goes, Oh, that's kind of what I was getting to earlier. Like, yeah, I'm going to be in the best shape of anyone out there. And that's so easy to say. And you know what, if we were doing CrossFit, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Harry Bink proves it. Yeah. He's the most fit. They, as a joke, hungover. They didn't even know there was money on the line. They did it for a press exercise. I mean, I, I, I probably shouldn't even be saying all this. They won Australian Spartan. Yeah. All right. Harry drove back in between because it was a party night that he was setting up at the 5060 compound. He shows up completely hammered on the second day and they were still, they were like literally three minutes into the, the, the course. They were two minutes ahead of second place. Like, and these are freestyle guys, not to be that guy, but like, yeah, it, people say, Oh, I'm so fit. Or I'm so whatever. And you look at the guys in motocross, you're like, Oh, they're not that fit. They don't train that hard. You guys have no idea the amount of injury and sacrifice and everything mm. that it takes to be the top of, of any sport really. But you look at a sport that not only takes balls to go out there and be like, I could literally die if I mess this up and I'm so tired. I can't hang on. Yeah. And I see that guy in front of me and I'm going to do a jump that I've never done at this condition when I'm like cross-eyed. And you and don't even think about it. It's not, not even a thought. You just no, send you, it. you do it and you take that risk and you know how to fall. And when you hit the ground, my dad always said, when you hit the ground, he goes, you get up, you get on your feet, you get back on the bike. Cause you can't tell if you're broken until you stand up. And I did it at X games. I landed, I stood up and I heard everything crunch and I fell down. I thought my dad was right. You know, when you're broken, <laughs> but hey, these guys are tough, man. And yeah. that's what it's, it's underestimated. Anyone that's the top. I don't, 
I don't care what sport. It could be uh, table tennis. If you're the best in the world at what you do, you've spent more hours than any amount of money is worth it to get there. But with motocross, you also put your life on the line. And when people say, oh, it's a life and death situation, most people are being metaphorically. Yeah. No, this is a life and death situation, especially even Nitro Circus. It's a show. Yeah, we got a snowmobile behind us, a four wheeler in front of us. We got a guy to our right and a guy to our left. And like as much as we party and have fun and everything, there was a guy that showed up first tour. Um, a couple guys got hurt. So he showed up and um, it was two nights in a row. After the first night, everyone kind of went out, had a few drinks. He had a few too many. He shows up and he's like, oh man, I didn't ride practice. I'm too drunk to ride. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Like thinking he was being be cool. Little Bilko. I mean, not little, but he's he's pretty scrying little dude. Yeah. Grabs him by the neck, puts him up against the wall. He goes, you're done. You're not riding today. Really? And everyone kind of backed him up. They're like, well, he's like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just really hung over. I don't feel like doing practice. He goes, if you don't feel like doing practice, if you don't feel like you can be at your absolute best and you move over three or four feet to the right, three, four feet yeah. to the left, you miss your cue. And I have to live with the fact that I landed on you because you crashed your flip and whatever, or you crashed your flip and I land on you and I get hurt. He goes, this is a family. And as much as we mess around, this is is our livelihood. It's our lives. And we are passionate about what you do. So if you can't drink, don't drink. Yeah. If you can't, like, if you can't hold your own, whatever you do, know that when you show up on show day, everyone around you is not just hoping that you do a good job for you. They are trusting their they life with you. you. Yeah. And, um, it was really cool for me to see someone like Bilko, who's the class clown to just, yeah, he's the last person that you'd think would do that. But Bilko, another, I'm not saying, um, to the same extent as Brian, but Bilko is very smart. He knows exactly what he wants. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. Some of the sponsors said, well, if you're not doing this event, this event, we're not going to sponsor. He goes, good. I just really want to hang out with my friends. And he goes, I want to go work for my dad and, and, you know, be home. Yeah. So he's like, that's okay. I'll, and he turned down the amount of money Bilko turned down to really be a part of Nitro Circus was, was something that, I mean, almost made me cry. Just like, man, these are my friends and this is what we're going to do. And it's see him and Cam Sinclair and all the guys, just yeah. how close they are. It's, it's a rad little environment. Dude, uh, just like today, for example, so we're out um, at the 5060 compound, Harry's shooting his new unit clip and I missed the double backflip by like two seconds. Dude, he texts me and he's like, cause I was on my phone and I told him that I text you that screenshot. And then, uh, he's like, just before he was like moving the ramp, he's like, Oi, did you text Travis that I was doing this? And I was like, nah. And he's like, good. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like, he'll fucking tell me not to do it or he'll tell me I can't. And he's like, I just want to send it. But like that commitment, man. So like, I'm get I'm getting paid. I went to work today, right? I get paid. I show up. I set up my camera. Harry gets out of bed and he gets his bikes and then he shows up and he does these tricks that can kill him. And the whole time he's got in his mind that I'm not going to get in X games if I don't do a double backflip to dirt off the super kicker. And it's like, which is probably not accurate at all, but I love that he's thinking that way. <laughs> but that's like, that was his thing. And this whole thing, he's like, there's this intense focus and everyone sees Harry fucking around. It's like, he's just a class clown sort of funny dude as well. He'll party till the all hours, but he'll show up. And he'll do his but, but when he shows up, no one's concerned that Harry's not going to do his job. Harry oh, will, yeah, he's he'll laser never let focus. you down. Oh yeah. He's and, great. And like, I'm there and I'm nervous for him to do this double flip. Not, I'm not nervous in his abilities. I'm not thinking he's doing something that's out of his uh, wheelhouse, but it's heavy. There's consequences that if the mistake happens, you know what I mean? But like, he's just going out there to be the best he can be on a day where he didn't have to. And he's like, he wouldn't even, this is how rad he is. He wouldn't even change his Jersey. Like it's a unit shoot for his new yeah. like, gear. And he's like, nah, man, I'm not changing my Jersey because they're going to think it's a different day than I did my rock solid flip, my, this flip, my, that flip. He's like, I want people to watch this and know it was the same day. And I'm just like, you're a fucking winner. Like everything about that is you're a winner. You are committed and you are going to do this for like, that's the right reasons. Like he just wants to, to be the guy and he fucking stood up and did it. I, I couldn't say it better. The, the wild part, even if you look at like guys like Steve Minnie, who no one really knows. I mean, everyone knows of Steve Minnie, but you know, it's one of those times when, you know, someone got hurt, like Duffy um, got hurt, or wasn't doing the front flip and Steve Minnie hadn't done a front flip in seven months and we're at the show and we're like, 
oh man, we need it. We need ending. We need someone to double backflip um, or someone to front flip. We got more beer. Ah, perfect. You. My man. Got some Rocky, <laughs> Rocky Mountain. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks, legend. America. <laughs> yeah, we had to do it. Oh, my hands are too slippery. Yeah, that's what, that's what all the girls say. Whoa. <laughs> oh, there we go. I got a broken wrist. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. I'm, good. I'm oh, good. good. I got it. Cheers. <laughs> Um, yeah, so ha- he, st- he oh. set Steve steps up. Yeah. So back to that. And Minnie goes, all right, the show needs it. He goes, Be- because we can think, oh man, well, it's just one show, but to half the people that come around, I mean, you know, it's 50, 60, hundred dollars a ticket. If they get the VIP, like for a family of four to mm. go to nitro circus. And that's, it sounds so ludicrous to think you're going to risk your life for, you know, someone's $50. Someone else's, $50. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it means more, it's more than that. Like it is deeper than that. I, I, I we all believe it. That's why we're, we're doing it. And Steve goes, I'm going to step up and we're over in Abu Dhabi who are, uh, sorry, Saudi Arabia where, I mean, medical, I'm sure it's great, but I, who knows? It's I, a crap I, shoot. I don't know. Um, you know, and he hits this thing and over jumps, over rotates, lands on his front end. He's got his wrist is almost fused. He's got his braces on. He like tackles the bike and hugs it in and, and makes it and the crowd goes absolutely nuts. And, but it's, it's like that. And it's like the, you know, the guys like Josh Sheehan, who he got called out on the announcer, with, um, Bruce was like, Hey, he's going to do a trick that no one's ever done. And he's, like, he's what? looking no, and he's I'm like, not. No, someone got the script wrong. Like I wasn't, and he hadn't done this trick since world games two years ago, two years. And he does the biggest double flip kiss of death I've ever seen in my entire life on a whim. And that's the thing about this crew. Now you don't want to call them out all the time, but they always step up and they always get it done. So when we were filming for action figures, we had a week now, two days from the end, most we had weather, we had rain, we had all this stuff go on. We were trying to film some other stuff and some, uh, some different, uh, car jumps and everything. And we got down and we're like, all right, two days, we got to do double backflip to double backflip trains with four guys. Oh. Harry goes out. We're all working on the airbag, trying to get it. He's like, I got nervous. He comes back. We're like, Whoa. Harry, he's shirtless, no pads, <laughs> bloody head to toe. Got, I mean, dirt all down his back. We're like, Harry, what did you do? He's like, oh, I went to the back and I, I double flipped and I over jumped the jump. I was like, the jump's not set. Hubert just said it like randomly, yeah. randomly. Yeah. Like it wasn't even straight. And he just assumed it was, I don't know what everyone was thinking. <laughs> He's like, I got nervous. So I just wanted to go hit it. So he goes all the way to flat. No one's got it on film. Just, he does a double backflip just because he got nervous and wanted to get it out of the way. And then steps back up, does it again in the train. Does it first one follows me on the second one. I mess up the first one. So we got to go around, do it again because we didn't get to the second one. The second one, he's messed up. His feet aren't quite right. I send the second one. He's like, Oh, I don't want to do this again. So he sends a second one lands. This guy's got no shirt on slams. I mean, just cool factor, you know, video got to, got to make your section look good. And Goldie, bro. Oh, just like dinghy stands up somehow. No, everyone, I still would have been laying there. You could have yeah. just put my grave in the ground right there. Doing a double back to your face was, was horrible. The next morning he gets up sores can be. So I go down six 30 cause I'm going to get the jump set up. He's in the hot tub at eight o'clock. He's still just doing, he's like, man, if I stop, I'm not going to, I'm just going to keep working out until you guys are ready. I'm like, shit, we better get ready quick. He's going to be tired. So we go and we got a BMX triple backflip moto double backflip train. So triple, double, triple, double, triple, double, triple, um, in theory to the same landing in theory. All right. First triple crashes. I actually landed my jump, which was cool. Everyone (laughs) crashes except for me. So Harry's in the air on a double. He sees just carnage. The whole landing is covered with bicycles, one motorcycle, uh, three bicycles and two people. One of the guys had gotten off and he lands and just lands perfect double backflip ejects off the side because we had like a little bag on top, like a, a two foot bag just to make it a little safer. Well, he belly flops straight. I mean, you could not have got oh, a no worse, shirt on too. No shirt straight to his head. Bike smashes him, gets up. And then he has to do the, the final, like the, our train section where everyone's together. And not one second did he think, you know what? I'm too sore for this. He's like, let's do it. Yeah. And he was back up there later. Everyone else would have been done. But that's Sorry for my stories are so long. They're hey, kind of boring. Why, that's but why like we have podcasts though. Yeah. Because that's the, that's the thing is like, 
when people see you for the most part, it's like the two minute Facebook clip or what you can fit in a story <laughs> or you know what I mean? Like that's the world now. So it's like, this is like, we got time. You just say what you want to say. <laughs> we got to talk about, um, so a lot of people don't know that when you, the crash, like, so that crash at the test track, was that pretty much like the career sort of defining thing for your supercross? Yeah. Well, it's funny cause I was out with Mac, um, and Godfrey and I think Dave Castillo it was like Castillo rant. So, um, I even Pingree was out there. Like a lot of the old school guys, if you, you follow yeah. that, um, oh, yeah, mate. way yeah. back, yeah, way back, way back. <laughs> um, no, so we were, we were just, so Mac had this jump and now we would have said you built it, you jump it, but we didn't have all those rules in place. Um, so he had kind of built this, this takeoff. So up. Ronnie Mac for those. Ronnie, sorry. Yeah. Ronnie yeah, Mac. Ronnie Mac. Um, yeah. So there's, there's two, basically it was two layers of, uh, barbed wire fences. And then there was another 50 feet up, um, where the, the grass kind of went over. And I was like, I could probably land just past the second barbed wire fence. Um, excuse me. So anyway, <laughs> you could probably land just past the second barbed wire fence, um, and be okay. But if you went a little further, I'm like, dude, fifth gear pinned, you're going to make it over the, the whole thing. And it's oh, not going to be an uphill. fifth gear pinned. But so I was looking and I'm talking to Mac and I'm like, whoa, like it looks good when we're sitting here. He's like, dude, it's so flat. He goes, I thought Ronnie did it off camera. Like I thought he did it before. That's what he said. He, he did, didn't do did, it. I, no, oh, sure. There's all these cameras around. He did it off camera. That's, that's what, not that that's what he said. That's, I, that's what, what he, he told me too. He's lying sack it. Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I, my opinion, my opinion, I maybe, Hey Mac, if you did it, I'm, I'm sorry. You'll, you know, we'll find out after <laughs> we're dead. Get the, get the, get the, get the, get the replay. Yeah. Um, but no, he said, he's like, dude, you can hit this six gear pin. I said, I don't have six gears. Like, whatever. Like, so I came out it. I'm like, dude, it's going to buck. It's going to buck. He's like, no, I, dude, I already hit it. It's, it's fine. You go right over. Just fast. The bike will go. No problem. That's like his story of his life. He's like, well, if you can't go too far, then, then why would you slow up? Just hit it as fast as it'll go. <laughs> and it makes sense. So I came at it and I was wide open. I gave it a little checkup just to kind of get the bike to set. Boop, 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 boop. I hit it. And that was the end of my supercross career. I knew it on the way up as the bike was die If I would have known what I know now, which would have been really amazing as hard as just that bike kicked, it. almost want to go back. Honestly, if I could have that exact same takeoff because the bike, for whatever reason, just, just buck everything that I had to hold it back. And it, it would have landed upside down. Like if I went with that on the takeoff, it would have been the biggest 200 foot step up fronty guy. It would have been great. But you see, that's, Another thing, like freestyle helps motocross so much because every time in a Superman, I'm like, oh, I got this. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get back on the bike. But um, but no, so I, I blew out my knee, I, I ACL, PCL, um, MCL, buckhead meniscus, dislocated kneecap, uh, tibia plateau fracture, which was the first of, of many. Just got all much cartilage left in there. Um, so I tried to race the next weekend. It was stupid. Like I basically went for a couple of weeks just so I would drain, my trainer would basically drain my knee every day um, to get it small enough to where it would bend far enough to get to the foot peg. And I usually get a moto in, um, maybe a little oh, bit more, some far, practice starts yeah. and then the knee would swell up too much. Um, so then we basically go home. So basically it was drain the knee ride and then swim. And then, uh, three rounds in, I just on my shoulder in the pool. Um, just because I had, I hadn't been used to doing, I was only doing upper body, yeah, like aerodyne, upper body, swimming, upper body, yeah. whatever, um, upper body weights. So I was like, I gotta be like, I gotta make up you for that. Do something, and yeah. yeah, I just, my shoulders already suck. So anyway, um, long so, story long. So Ronnie Mac effectively ruined my, yeah, the more of the story is Ronnie Mac ruined my supercross career. My racing career was over, but invented freestyle basically out of that. But the nitro circuit started because of Mac. So I, you know, Ronnie Renner still gets so pissed off at me because I landed on him in the day qualifier at Indianapolis. Are you serious? And it was, so he had put all of his money, like literally went there, didn't have a dime left to go race supercross. He's leading the day qualifier. I'm like day qual, come on, whatever. It's like the C cool. class on our cool. lens. Yeah. But it's, it's cool. And you know, Mac actually, and never mind, long story. So a whole different story. But, um, so landed on Renner. I got up. I still qualified. I don't see what the problem was, but he didn't qualify for the main event. If you did, he could have. Exactly. Right. I was fine. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just landed on his wrist. He should have been okay. Um, so he blames me for ruining his racing career when I think I made his freestyle career, <laughs> Renner's freestyle career, <laughs> which arguably was probably the move for him. 
Yeah, he, dude, he's the second winningest freestyle rider of all time at X Games. <laughs> Did you say, was that like a was that like a really fucking smooth setup? I, I feel like a complete asshole. I'm going to blame Coors. Uh, where are you at with your body now? Like, are you? Shit. Um, I mean, obviously it's <laughs> up the shit. But where, like, how um, much are you looking into like new treatments and like stem cells and all that kind of like? Are you re- are you going after that side of things, or are you going to kind of wait till you stop breaking it? Yeah, I mean. Honestly, like our family, East Coast based, um, you know, it's like even we had one of my um, cousins, like he lost a a scholarship because he got caught uh, smoking weed. And for my family, like even that, like it's odd because they all drink. So it, whatever. My wife's from California, like a bunch of hippies, all those druggies, yeah, you know, yeah, but it's yeah. not like, it's, it's an interesting thing. Coffee's to, a drug guys. Yeah, no, Coffee's a drug. no, but that's, yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, it's that East coast, like old school old, mentality. Like that's a, that, that's a real thing that I don't think a lot of people consider when you look from the outside in, especially not California and not like the, um, the blue States. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Golden blue, blue states. states. <laughs> so we're uh, Maryland's kind of, yeah, Maryland's a blue state, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so they um, that's the most northern southern state. Anyway, that's that's off off the right off the yeah, subject. Yeah, I so um, at the end of the day, like the doctors that I know, the family, the way that I was raised is like, look, if you work hard, if like everything that you do, like my dad, they're like, oh, he's got a fused wrist, a fused thumb. And they're like, oh, you can't ride. He's like, bullshit. You just get everything else stronger around it. So same thing. My uncle uh, played quarterback for Broncos, um, you know, knees, back, shoulders, everything's messed up. But he goes, you just physically, you keep working, you keep stretching, you keep um, my dad. They're like, oh, your knee will never, um, you'll never bend. He's got full motion in it. Um, You you break up the scar tissue, you keep working at stuff. And they're, their mentality on the East coast is completely look you, your body will heal itself if you just work at it. Yeah. And basically the hammer technique. So I've always gone off the hammer technique and there's a lot of guys, especially Australia and the, really the skate world in general that, um, they're working on, um, you know, stem cell and, and a lot of the different stuff to help regrow tissue and do different stuff. And it just hasn't hit the East coast yet. And all the doctors well, that you I know, like, you know, um, cause you used to do a ton of stuff in Panama, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But again, that's, that's a, so my doctors at home are like, look, if you have a cancer or anything else, this is regrowing that stuff too. It's yeah. regrowing, it, it's regrowing yeah. everything. I said, look, just if you do it, do it right. And I haven't yeah. been to that point, but it's been a really cool thing. And sorry for interrupting you there, but, no, no. um, working with a lot of the military guys and it's been awesome. Cause my dad, um, you know, being a Marine, we'd always go, uh, you know, even when we couldn't afford it, um, he'd sponsor one, um, you know, one dinner for all the, um, the vets yep, that came yep. through cause DC is where they, all the, the wounded warriors come in and, yep. um, you know, just, just to kind of help give back a little bit there and always bring the guys out, you know, all the, the guys that are injured or amputees or anything. And they come out and they ride four wheelers and razors or, or just watch depending on what their, you know, what their level of recovery is. And, um, you know, through that, um, we've, found a lot of lifelong friends. My best friend growing up ended up being a Navy SEAL, um, you know, and just this whole military kind of, um, influence yep. being from Annapolis, Maryland, where the Naval Academy is yep. and all that. There's just so much that's right there. Um, they have a lot of the same mentality. So long story long, got talking and they have, um, basically a boot campaign, um, is this organization that helps wounded, um, vets, uh, come back and they started working on head injuries and all this other stuff. And cause they're giving up so much money to the government and this could be for good or for bad, but they're like, so everyone's just claiming PTSD. So yeah. let's diagnose it. Let's figure it out. And they let nitro circus be the first non-military on board with this. It was basically 20 times more powerful than any MRI. And three of us went through and no CTE for any of us, um, in, uh, of the three. Yep. Um, that went through this, um, didn't have, you know, no long-term brain stuff as of, as of yet explained top to bottom, you know, the protocols and why they're in place and why it, it changes. And anyway, it gave us a, a lot of information about yeah. that, but also said, they said, look of everyone that we've gone through so far, they're like, your heads are all fine. But so they they do six tests, physical tests, um, just mobility tests. Yeah. And they said, this is, these tests will tell us how well you're going to go into your, your later, later life. life. Yeah. And I failed four of the success. 
I aced one of them though. So what was the one good. you got? Um, I have uh, flexibility forward so I can touch my toes. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're not a hard tests. So but, that'll uh, be good when it uh, comes to time to change your nappies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, just ba- basically like, you know, do a squat. How far can your knee go over your, yeah. like, so I'm just fused in so many ways. So they said, okay, so I'm going to go this year and I'm going to spend one month at the Virginia, um, basically, um, high intensity, uh, training facility where they, they use, and they said, most of the guys that come back with PTSD, um, you know, they have been, it is trauma, yeah. but a lot of them, their whole life has revolved around sports and, yeah. and doing stuff and, and being with this, this tight knit family at which it was nitro circus and action sports fits right in. And then you get hurt. Um, like guys like Jim to champ, um, you know, just hit his head and his back's fused and he can't do what he loves. So he's working construction, nothing wrong with construction. But when you come from that, it's, it's the full army thing though, because like, it's like what we said, like those friendships that you have, uh, that you create, uh, they're like forged in fire. Like there's no five minute friends on the nitro tour. Like the guys that you roll yep. with are like guys that have seen you in the fucking trenches, man. Like you said, the foam pit stuff, the injury stuff, like eight months before you can walk again. Like that's, there's a respect that you get gain from anyone that's on a team, a sports team, someone that, you know, there's a respect that you gain or lose yeah. in there that you can't gain by working yeah. equipment. You're not going to take a bullet for your, your buddy on, yeah. you know, in construction. And it's, it's just different. Yeah. Um, so they said most of the guys that have PTSD and the long-term issues are just people that are, it's not to say that it's not a real thing because it definitely they're is. They're just like struggling to adapt to and the, then now they have a lost yeah. leg or their, their legs are fused or their shoulders don't work or whatever. And they said, if we can get these guys back training, they said some guys, it takes, um, three months, some guys, it takes three weeks. Um, they want me there for a month. They go, look, you're, you're obviously you're not missing a, a limb. Yeah. Um, but we can get you walking normal. Cause I can't walk with my kids now. If they're like, Hey, let's go, you know, walk the park. My knees swell up. Like I can't walk yeah. or run. Like I can bicycle fine. So I'll be on with them or whatever, but I still have one that's on a, a strider. So we kind of have to push her most yeah. of the way. Um, but like, I want to be able to do these things in the future. And they said, look, if you got about 10 years that your body's still going to kind of recover if you work at it. Yeah. But if you work at it, they're like we can get you walking or we can get you doing this and that's going to help your head and that's going to help your long-term CTE yeah. and all this stuff. Cause when you stop doing um, physical activity, that's when your brain really starts shutting down. So it's, it's kind of that East coast mentality again, and that's a military mentality, but you can physically work yourself into where your body works better. Well, the mind's the thing, like the mind is the key to it all. The mind is the king of the castle. And if you can control like, Again, like you go back to Harry, like I've seen that dude hung over as shit. Like I've stayed in bed and he's gone on a 10 K run and I'm drinking my coffee. I've just had a couple of Advils and I'm scrolling on Instagram and I'm looking at his story while he's on a 10 K run. We did the same shit the night before. I couldn't think of anything worse, but you get in that headspace of like, I can't versus I can. And if you can, if you can keep that momentum going, but it gets harder when your brain is almost locked in a cage where your body can't do the things that it wants to do. But that's, that's the thing. If you can't do what you yeah. always, your go-to like Jim, he's like, I can't go to a skate park. He's like, I can, I can roll around, but I, I did that when I was 10. Yeah. Like I can't do what I could do before. And you got like guy like Harry Bank and kind of the nitro circus mentality. So the nitro circus mentality is basically if you go out there he goes, whatever you do the night before should not affect what you were planning on doing yeah, the next day. Off. And if it does, then, then you got a problem. You got to scale it back. Yeah. You got to scale it back. Yeah. You, gotta, <laughs> you, gotta, you know, and there's, you know, there's certain times to celebrate and there's certain times to do whatever, but Harry's awesome because he goes out there and doesn't matter what he's doing the night before. It does not change. He's not, a, he will never flake out on, if he yeah. says a week before I'm going to be, and he keeps getting me to the gym at five 30. And it's yeah, like I'm an hour from the place. I'm like, yeah. I'm getting up at four. I'm like, look, this is, this is becoming an issue. Your training is becoming, is affecting my life. But the best part is I get, I'm back at home before my kids wake up and they yeah. wake up at seven. So that is odd, but it's good. <laughs> Dude, I'm really glad I was going to ask about the whole CT thing because I think Dave mirrors deal was a shockwaves through the industry. Everyone that we know has had concussions, multiple concussions, and you're a guy that's in that category. And I wondered how across that you were. And if Dave, cause when Robbie Madison was on the podcast, like we spoke about it for a lot because I was at Robbie's house the day that 
Maddo spun out about it a bit. Yeah. Um, well, there was the the day before the pipe dream premiere when he crashed his BMX bike and he went into like intensive care and had that, like that was heavy. And I think that one really was like, okay, fuck, you know? And I, I wondered how across that whole thing you were, because I, I feel like medicine's getting better and knowledge is power when it comes to that kind of stuff. So like, actually I wanted to talk about, but I'm glad you said that you've like done some testing and it's like something you're actually across and sort of looking at. Oh, you just want to know what, especially for nitro, like you got guys that, um, you know, and that's, it's interesting, the airbag stuff and people think of airbags as, um, you know, gel free tough. fluffy, yeah. but, um, so, uh, rhinorrhea, it's where your brain, the brain fluid leaks out of like basically the shell that it's in. So your brain's in a fluid shell, if you will, an yep. egg. Um, well, Dusty Weigel on the airbag, um, he had 15 or 20 hits exactly the same way, trying to get this trick, trying to get this trick, trying to get this trick. And he's not even that dizzy, but he just has all this fluid drains out and he kind of falls over. And drains out of where? His nose. Oh. So rhinorrhea is not gonorrhea. It's <laughs> brain, brain fluid. Um, so if you hit the same spot over and over and over again, so they said the highest percentage um, as far as any sport of CTE is female soccer because really? oh. you hit headbutt, same spot. They practice over and over and no over again. Way. So it's the the airbags and the resis that are actually a little bit more traumatic as far as um because you can get away with hitting and without like the broken bone yeah, kind of consequences. Well, yeah, you're like, oh, that just rung my bell, but that rung my bell a little bit. But yeah. those are the impacts. Um, so boxing, Dave was a boxer and I don't know how many people knew that. I mean, yeah, people knew he was a little really bit. into it, huh? Really into boxing. Now boxing, you're going to hit the same spot. So the doctor was really interesting. He goes, look, he goes, if you're in an impact sport, um, so this is going through um, all the boot campaign guys and we did a whole week of testing. You know, it was pretty rad, but he goes, if you're in an impact sport, chances are you're not predisposition to CTE and all this stuff. But he goes, if you ever have two hits exactly the same in exactly the same spot there before it heals, there's 100% chance of brain damage. Now I don't have brain damage. Jim DeChamp doesn't have brain damage. Um, and James Foster doesn't have, um, brain damage. We were the three that went through that had the most concussions that just were like, okay. Um, so I, I can't talk about those guys much yeah, and what's, what's going on. But, um, but anyway, so all of us were, were good there. Um, they said, look, you stay active. They said, look, your, your body, your brain is a house, right? So every time you hit it hard enough, um, it puts a hole in the floor. You hit it hard enough. You get a big hole in the floor. Now to get your brain to reconnect, to basically rebuild that floor, um, it takes activity. It takes clean eating. It takes clean, not drinking. So, you know, a lot of people, they get hurt. They, they lose what they're doing. They, they start drinking more alcohol. They start doing less physical. Yeah, they're like, yeah. you'll never heal. So they said, look, if you live really clean, like you can repair almost anything barring brain damage. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't feel like yourself, your emotion changes, all this other stuff. They go, think about this. You hide all your demons in the basement. Well, you get a hole there and all of a sudden you start crying more. Yeah. You get angry, you get sad, you get happy, you get whatever, because all everything, there's stuff that you just can't put back in the basement because you get a big hole in it. Yeah. But you live healthy, you work hard, you get that blood flowing. Everything's about, you know, kind of blood flowing and then reconnecting that stuff. Yeah. Like you can connect anything and they have stuff they can do it like basically electric zap you. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, that does help. He's like, I can make you happy. I can make you sad. I can make you everything. Just sit down over there. We'll, we'll zap really? you back. I'm like, that's cool. I'm good. But I you think know, I'll just slide on that one. Uh, but Jim, you want to go? Yeah. You, you want to go first? <laughs> Tell me how it works. Um, no, so, but, but it is a really interesting thing, but the coolest part of that guy about the whole thing was the fact that he did say it is very person dependent. Yeah. He goes, if you make it in an impact sport in any way, you're probably pretty okay in general, yeah. unless you hit the same spot twice. Um, so the interesting part about that, um, was that a guy like Bilko, he's had one concussion his entire life and God knows he's hit his head harder than any yeah. of us over and over. We used to call him Gumby because the guy just like bounced up. Hey guys, <laughs> um, no problems. And he finally had one concussion where it was the gnarliest slapper 360 impact you've ever seen or, uh, sorry, la lazy boy. Yeah. Um, 
Cliffhanger backflip. Sorry, I'm getting all my sorry. You've said a few tricks. Getting all you've my said crashes. I'm getting my crashes confused. But cliffhanger backflip missed. Land gnarly slapper. Out cold for five minutes. Wakes up perfectly fine. No vomiting. No headache. Nothing. Broken uh, collarbone. Yeah. <laughs> but but Which you know, you'd be pumped with if you had to have that crash and pick something. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, sorry, that sounds callous, but no, yeah, no, no, no that's real. We know. <laughs> Um, so he goes, look, a guy like Bilko, he goes, I have some guys that were fighters that you could literally, he goes, and we can't test this. He mm. says, <laughs> anyway, I won't say the comparison they use, but he goes, yeah. you can't literally hit people over the head with baseball bats and then see how they recover and this kind of stuff and yeah. you know, how long it takes. But, but you can see other sports where similar things happen and you can see the patterns kind of thing. Yeah. And he goes, look, Bilko, he goes, I would have cleared him. He could be out cold for 10 minutes. He goes, I would clear him to get back out. But he goes, the reason we can't do that is because you all are a bunch of liars. Yeah. He goes, I've never met an athlete that's told me, oh yeah, I'm a hundred percent. Of course you're going to say you're a hundred percent. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, you don't even remember saying it and you're like, oh no, I'm perfectly fine. Yeah. So that's what everything protocols. But as an athlete, as a, if you're not tired, if you don't have a droopy eye, if you don't have your eye, I mean, you got to get, shit. obviously go get checked out. Make sure you don't have bleed. Make sure you don't have all this. Stuff. I'm not saying yeah, 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 disobey no, yeah, the doctors yeah, yeah. in any way, shape, or form. Um, but you know your body, and that's what I always kind of thought. I've had a lot of concussions. Yeah, and he goes, "You'll know." There's sometimes you hit your head, not hard at all. You don't really even have a concussion. I was throwing up for two and a half months after just smacked the side of my head. Wasn't knocked out. Like remember pretty much everything. Like it was but fuzzy. It just did a, enough to really. And do I didn't have brain bleeding. The doctors were like, "I guess you're okay," but it. At a certain point, I just stopped throwing up and I got my energy back. And he goes, yeah. until that point, if you would have hit that same spot. Yeah. That's when you get that second impact syndrome. You'd have been in really big trouble. Yeah. So, but you know, just to know that is, is kind of nice. So you, were you worried about it before you went and saw this guy? Like, was there kind of a party that was like, fuck, I have hit my head a lot. Not really because. I, you know, your body kind of thing. And I, I was just naive and ignorant. Um, but he backed up a lot of it, which was, look, you know how you feel. If you're, yeah. if you don't feel right, if something just feels off and that's the hardest part to diagnose, especially your first concussion. Cause you're like, well, I don't feel quite right, but I'm not really hurt. And I didn't really, yeah. I wasn't knocked out. So I'm good. No, you're not good. But you have to make that call. And that's, you know, when you have a team or something, they're all going to call you sissies and it's going to yeah. suck. But like that's, or there's a championship on the line or yeah. you've got three races to go. Uh, and God knows if I did the right thing all the time, I would, I wouldn't have. Yeah. And there's like, that's another part of it too, is like, that's the kind of missing X factor is like, well, you are hurt. There is this thing wrong, but you've spent your whole life to be in this position to win this championship. And then there is, and, there is that, and you know what I mean? Probably you'll be okay. But is the rest of your life as a vegetable worth that? And that's something that, but how many dudes are on the gauntlet? Yeah. A lot. You've probably done it a lot. Harry Bink last year and he fooled our medics did. <laughs> I, I, I looked into his eyes and that's, that's honestly one of the biggest reasons I went to see these guys was for just being that person who sees Aaron wheels, fathering him smack his head and get up. And you can tell he's not yeah. quite right. And he's like, I want to do it again. The crowd's going up and he yells in the mic, I'm going to do it again before you have a chance. You're like, and the doctor's like, yeah, he's, yeah. he's okay. But it's those situations that it, it's Are really you talking hard about when Harry did the front flip and crashed when Harry did the front flip. Thank you for getting me back on. Cause he, he talked about that on the podcast and I, I was almost like, I was like, fuck, should I that? like put that in? Because I'm like going, dude, you're just, you're saying you were knocked out. But then like he said it on the podium, live TV, Harry gets up. He goes, I don't really remember what happened the first time. I, I guess I crashed cause I don't have a visor, but thank you for supporting me. And I'm like, at oh, that point, shit. that just, <laughs> Basically, anyone that hits their head that hard from now on out at NX Games or Nitro World Games, we have to pull them no matter what, because that got by that our medics. The cracks, we yeah. had, and but it would happen so fast, and the doctors were out there, and he just waved them off. And you know, Harry's he's got that pep in his step, and the doctors yep. are like, "Well, I, you know, no one and really the machine, the live TV machine, and it's a, like it's in a frenzy. Everyone's like as controlled as it is. You have two minutes, yeah, to to land that trick before we're off air. Yeah, you get two minutes. Yeah." I, I, you know, and I'm up on, I'm on the booth and I'm announcing. So I, I want to like, like I can see, like I can even, I can see his eyes through the, 
through the yeah. video and I'm like, ah, oh, this is what we got. Someone's got to stop. But like, but Harry, but to tell Harry at that point, who's he's fine. And you know what chances are? He's going to land the trick. And he did. And he won the, I mean, he's the big air world champion Yeah, because he went back out there and that payment when set he him should, up. When he shouldn't, you know, but he, but yeah. again, you run that goal. And I, like I said to this, I said this to him on the podcast and he hadn't really thought of it like this. And it was cool to sort of see the reaction. I was like, Travis Pastrana is best trick. That's Travis's thing. X games, the whole, this sport was built on Travis Pastrana best trick. He doesn't do best trick anymore. And now he's built these ramps that I bet he wishes he had. And he's gave given you guys this platform that he probably wishes he got to ride in. And you just won that. I was like, you're the dude that lived Travis Pastrana's vision. <laughs> and he was just like, Poof. but it was, but it's, that's, it's what, true. that's what happened. And it's like, but it takes going through a fucking gnarly concussion to be that guy that lives this vision. And it, you know what I mean? So it's like, there's so much more than just a concussion. And I mean, like what's worth it to Harry in that moment to live out the thing that he wanted to live out since he first put Revelation 199 in a VHS. <laughs> but really? No, it's like funny. That, but that, that's what happened. So here's an interesting thing. So you have all the sponsors that put the money into World Game. You have Harry Bink, who's saying he's fine, who put all this time and all this effort and knows that he can land this trick. And he did. Yeah. And everything wants this big ending that would have been such an anticlimax if Harry goes out and crashes and then calls it a day at the end, everyone goes home thinking, ah, that event wasn't that good. Are they going to tune in next time? No. Is it going to affect honestly sponsorship for years to come for nitro circus? Yes. Is it going to affect, um, more riders for years to come? Is it going to affect everything? Yes. And selfishly we want to see that, but also it's like, yeah. so that's it's why it's heavy. It's, ah, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fine line. It's not a fine line. It's let him go. Well, and if, when he, pulls and if, it off, you know if he I mean? crashes, then it's, it's worse than worse. It's yeah. like, it's, it's, but if he lands it and he know he can, and you're rooting for him to do it, but at the same time. So for me, I think the hardest part about being now a father, having a wife in nitro, having all my best friends in these sports is, you know, that's why we went to the boot campaign thing and why I went to the military thing and said, yeah. okay, like at the end of the day, because honestly, ignorance is bliss too, man. Yeah. But now we know. Yeah. That's what and I'm now saying. There's so, no like, excuse. so it's harder for you to know, like yeah. as a, the dude, as the ringleader of the circus, <laughs> it's easier. Ignorance is bliss. And that's the move if you don't want to, but it goes to show the way that you care about these guys because it's easier not to know. And for yourself, man, I bet like when you went to do that CTE test and there had to be a part of you that was gone fuck, am I going to see this black spot on my brain? You know, you know what I mean? How are you functioning? But like, uh, there had to be that as well on your behalf. But you know, the most interesting thing and with Red Bull, we went through a, a similar, um, so I've done like three different kind of tests. Mm. This was the most in depth, but I've been the top half, the top 1% on every one on attention span, but just cause that competitive nature kicks in. They're like, you're, you're mediocre kind of the average IQ on everything, maybe even a little low until shit hits the fan. And they said, when everyone else starts fucking up, that's when your brain turns on. They're like, you are like, like if we can get you in that bottom of the ninth situation, you probably don't even know that reference over here in Australia, but like yeah. everything's on the line. They're like, everything starts firing parts of your brain that shouldn't fire. But I don't really buy in all of this stuff because they said where, so there's a dead spot in my brain. It is where you're supposed to basically, um, talk, speak your speech, everything. Yeah, As right. I mess that up, it kind of makes sense now. But, <laughs> um, so in theory, I have a spot in my brain that doesn't work. And that is what they think scientists say is the spot that allows you to talk. I never fucking shut up. <laughs> so I'm not sure they're accurate in all their diagnosis, but dude, I wanted to talk to you too. I don't know if you like talking about it or if you don't, but the night terror thing. Oh yeah. So I've had night terrors my whole life, but I don't th from like stories and stuff that I've heard you say you you're like screaming and yelling and, and that sort of stuff. Like what is your experience of having a night terror? Because mine is like a completely silent thing. Like I basically, um, so for me, like I haven't really done psychedelic drugs or anything like that, but me basically <laughs> I think of what 
for like I've fucking looked into this because I'm very interested in in what is actually happening. But like I've looked at stuff of like DMT and acid and people's experiences and shit like that. And um I get this thing where I get like a there's still reality. I'm still awake in my head, but shit starts shifting in on me. There's noises, there's feelings. I get like weird feeling in like my throat, like really fucking gnarly, uncomfortable, get me out of here. Like I want to go, but I can't like, and then my body stops. I can't move at all. There's no, there's no get up. There's no wake up. There's no, like, I feel like I'm awake. You but can I still hear what's going on. And I'm fully paralyzed, yep. but I get yeah. It's, and there's feelings associated. Like, so I'll go to, I can go to bed and it doesn't happen very much now. It happened a lot when I was younger, but when I, I, I hit like, I'll hear a sound or like start, things start to sound different to me and I'll get like a different feeling, like in the roof of my mouth, it sounds fucking kooky, but then I, I just don't go to sleep at that point. I'm like, I'm scared of it. I'm like, nah, I'm staying awake. I'll put the TV on, I'll have a coffee and I'll ride the storm out. So it's like something that I can even feel when I'm awake. And if I go to sleep while I've got those little warning lights, I'm fucked. And I spend all night in like a paralysis terror zone that I can't get out of. I've actually not had a lot of people that have experienced that before. Yep. All right. So um, are you, are you in so, a similar boat with that? Well, <laughs> I had, they almost on the plane, they almost, uh, so the flight attendants were freaking out. Cause I get sometimes where similar, to what you're saying, and, and this is, I guess it's normal. It runs in my family. So I, yeah. I just always assumed it was normal. And then Lindsay was like, I've never seen that. And then like, anyway, so I get where, um, you're awake, but yeah. you can't move anything. Like not your eyes, not anything. Yeah, and you're, you're completely, so you can hear everything, but you have all these different, like you said, different anxieties and different, whatever is going through, but you're fully awake. So I could hear the flight attendant going, sir, yeah. you know, put your seat up for landing, sir. And then I can feel myself being shaken, but I, I physically am completely paralyzed. And they're like, Oh, what are we going to do? Like, and like, I'm like, Oh, I hope they don't have like defibrillators. I hope they check my pulse. Like I'm fine. Are your eyes open or closed? Closed. Yeah. Okay. But do you feel like you can see the set? that you were in? Oh no. I'm, uh, so, so, well, so like, I, I get, I get two different, well, no, I was actually in an airplane this time and I could hear everything oh, going around, but I physically couldn't move. Yeah. And then I finally like broke out of it and she definitely thought I was messing with her. Cause I was like, yeah, really? <laughs> she like freaks out. And like, anyways, it wasn't funny, but anyway, so my biggest fear though. So I have three different things. One is that, that I think happens to a lot of people. It happens to everyone in my family anyway, um, where you just can't move, but you can hear everything. You're, you're yeah. awake. Um, number two is what typical night terror. I don't remember any of my night terrors. I remember nothing about them, but again, on the plane and planes are probably my most scary part. I had all my friends on this plane and I fell asleep before the plane took off. So we're just about to take off down the runway. And I was close to the front of the plane as a big plane. And I woke up yelling Fuck! at the top of my lungs at a full sprint running to the back of the plane and had to walk back past everyone like, <laughs> just in, terror. in the plane. Thank goodness. It was, this, this was right before nine 11. Like oh. this is, this is a long time. I, mean, I was you know 16 or whatever. Yeah. Um, but like everyone's looking because I, if I was running towards the cockpit, I think I would have got shot by yeah, TSA at sure. this point. Um, so I'm always afraid to kind of go to sleep on a plane. And the third one, and this is the most messed up one. This is when I wake up and I see everything fully awake. But I also see dead people. No, sorry. Oh, <laughs> Don't use that as your quote. <laughs> no, no, I see, yeah. um, no, I just, I see stuff that's not there, which yeah, is right. like, and it's obviously not there. Cause I'm like, Lindsay, like, she's oh, like and, and you're awake. I'm a, I mean, I'm awake. Yeah. Yeah. But so here, here's the, here's the trippiest part. All right. So I had hieroglyphics in my room, woke me up almost nightly for about a month. And really? I'm like, I mean, writing walls, but lit up. So I'm like, all right. So I went and I invested in blackout shades, got yeah. everything to where there was no light in the room. And I put clothes everywhere and stuff and just like threw stuff everywhere, like bells and different stuff. And I'm like, all right. Cause obviously, and then I put a Sharpie and I just chucked it off the wall and I'm like, the room's pitch black. Yeah. I'm like, all right, this is, this will prove, this will prove to me that, that I can't like that the room doesn't light up with hieroglyphics at night. Yeah. So about a weekend, wake up, full rooms all lit up, hieroglyphics. I'm like, 
So you feel like you're waking up and then you're looking and there's I'm looking stuff up, on but, the wall. Yeah. It's like writing, but it's like, it's like a movie. I'm sure I just saw a movie somewhere, but so I got like, basically like, it looks like I'm inside an Egyptian, like uh, yeah. like a pyramid. Yeah. And I got uh, those hieroglyphics all over the wall and I'm like, all right, rooms lit up. So I get out of bed and I walk around and I go back in the corner and pick up the Sharpie. I'm like, man, room's definitely lit up. Found the Sharpie. Walk back, put the Sharpie to the wall, and the room goes black. Right as I was starting to write my first line. Because really? I was going to Sharpie the whole room up for like uh, a beautiful mind kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, Just yeah. like start. I got to see if they mean anything. Um, and But from that point on, I'm like, all right. Somehow, I was able to get up in my sleep and find a Sharpie that in I the threw dark. across the room in the dark without tripping or hitting anything. Well, maybe I did. I Maybe it was like, uh, what was that movie where uh, the guy drives the Lamborghini back and then he was oh. like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> but, the walls yeah, yeah, yeah. That could have been me. So I, I, I got no video proof of this. But, but anyway, so yeah, I've just gone to the theory that I have some screws loose and they've been loose since before I had my first concussion. And I'm all right with that. Yeah, there's, uh, there's not many people that I can even talk to about it because it's just it's so bizarre and you explain it and like you go like man this must sound fucking crazy but yeah like but what well, a I lot get, of guys in action sports a lot of guys in this kind of stuff so not to break you up again but red bull said i'm really low so the the doctor did the test he had no idea about my night terrors or whatever he goes oh you get night terrors i was like okay explain he said you uh your sleep patterns are atrocious yeah um they did like a sleep for a two months or whatever. And just you're always on different time zones and airplanes yeah, and yep. the show, you'll be up till two o'clock that morning. And then you're up at four o'clock the next morning doing whatever. And then you know, just, you're know never up and uh, whatever he goes, when you do that and you provide stress on your body, which is also injuries, which you're always recovering from something and you're sick a lot because you're always traveling and there's germs Exposed and planes so and much, yeah. whatever. He goes, um, your body is lacking all the, the B vitamins. Your um, adrenals are completely shot and B vitamins actually produce melatonin. Uh, so he goes without melatonin, he goes, you're super tired all the time. But you can't stay asleep. I'm like, well, I'm super tired all the time. I wake up screaming, yelling, and then just walk back and go back to sleep. But <laughs> tried all over. But yeah, all over again. Over. yeah. Um, cause I, I can sleep in a second anywhere. He goes, I, I'm like that too. I'm, I'm out, but so try, uh, B vitamins and melatonin. Huh. Um, so it, it has helped, uh, night terrors, uh, for me just in that it keeps me asleep. I don't know if it helps the night terrors or just drugs me so much that I don't wake up, but either way it seems to be okay. Yeah. There's definitely, yeah, there's, there's not that many people where I like can be like, Hey, does this happen to you? Because I've, I've met like 99.9% .9 of people are like, nah, man, this just sounds fucking weird. But dude, I remember like I'd have times where, cause I used to sleep in a top bunk, me and my brother oh, would share Nikes. that. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I'd be like frozen in a, and, and I'd kind of have like a, some of them were like sort of horror sort of dreams where you'd see people opening your doors and like coming into the room and then you're frozen. But you're actually and, in your room. Yeah. And I'm watching my room. Yeah. Like I'm looking at everything and yeah. then like people that are like looking at me while I sleep and like fucked up shit like that. That. But, um, man, I'd like, I'd spend all night, man. And my bed would be just completely drenched in sweat. And then I'm like, it, it, it felt like it would take nine hours to work up the courage to pull my sheet down to get out like, but not like courage as in like, I was scared to get out of bed, but just like almost like that physical, like, uh, I guess I wouldn't say like, okay. So you're just numb and then you're trying to work to get feeling back or like, remember, like if you try and type your name while both your hands are numb, that yeah. kind of like just impossible to do tasks sort of thing. So then I'd like get out and I'd, I'd walk down the hallway and it felt like an hour of walking down the hallway. And then I get in my room and my parents' room and then I just like cry on the floor and then I'd be like, don't touch me, everyone leave me alone. And like, you just sit there or like go sit in the lounge room and you're just trying to like bust out of whatever the fuck you're in. Now like, pic picture doing that when your dad is a, a drill sergeant in the Marine Corps. Yeah, my parents you, are very nice about it. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm not even going to say what was said, but it, it really helped me to kind of now because he's, my dad, snap was, out of my it. dad was, well, not snap out of it. Like I still, a lot of the similar things, but like, I just go right back to sleep. Cause my dad's like, look, no one has ever died from this. Yeah. He goes, and you know what? Get, if anything that you see actually hurts you in any way, shape or form, then we talk yeah. until then stop being a bitch. <laughs> go to sleep, son. <laughs> all right. I can do that. So that's kind of my theory. I'm like, ah, eh, nothing's hurt me yet. I'll be all right. Yeah. It's just a, yeah, it's just a weird thing. Like there's just gotta be some weird. Cause like they think that, um, like, have you ever heard of DMT? No. So that's like a, that's like basically the most powerful psychedelic drug 
in the world uh, that well that they like know of, but it's in everything, right? So <laughs> what? <laughs> so basically, yeah, this will freak you out. So like lettuce, fucking spinach, all this like that's I eat too much salad. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No, but ba- so like we have a natural thing in our stomach. It's called like a MIO inhibitor or something. There's like a bunch of technical shit. Basically, we have en- enzymes in our stomach that counteract the product like DMT. So like everything that we eat, we have chemicals in our body to deal with it. Otherwise we'd be high as fuck all the time. And it's like, we don't have chemicals. So if we ever tried something that was actually substantial, we'd probably be completely screwed. Well, yeah. So what happens is you, so like, have you ever heard how people go into like the jungle to do like ayahuasca and shit like that? So ayahuasca is this DMT, but what happens is like the, the, fucking Amazon people, what, whoever it was that it's all through South America. They figured out that cause there's a, there's different roots that contain like a lot of DMT. And then there's this, um, like, no, there's leaves that contain DMT root that contains a blocker. So anyway, they've, they combine the two things. So they combine the drug plus the thing that makes your stomach not block the drug. And then that's what ayahuasca is. So you drink it. So it's just in plants, but they reckon that DMT is what is released when you dream. So that's like, there's similar sort of that. Yeah. They call it like the spirit drug or whatever. Cause yeah, basically you, you dream and your body produces this. So like we have it, but there's things stopping it from making it psychedelic, but it's all this like weird feeling geometric patterns, like all this crazy shit. So anyway, I just wanted, but that's what's happening when you dream. They think this isn't a podcast. This is an intervention, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I don't know where we go for that, but that, so that's the stuff that I've looked into because of the, I guess just the feeling I'll, it feels like you go to like this different place and you don't have any control over it. And to me, that's what psychedelic drugs seem like. So it just seem it's like maybe there's a chemical thing where it's like they're releasing like too much of that shit to where it's like counterproductive and not like nice dreams about doing double backflips and shit. <laughs> so don't know where the fuck we go from that. I, that, I need, I needed to ask you about that, it. That, that might be where we <laughs> yeah. How long have we been going for? 140 uh, a minute and uh, an hour and 49 minutes. What, um, what else you got coming up? We got to talk about some of that stuff. Ah, uh, yeah. So we got action figures coming up. Um, should be Is pretty that, cool. So uh, the second movie that you guys basically first action figures, uh, my two goals were to get, uh, quad flip on BMX and triple flip on moto. Um, so it took us about two years and a lot of ramps and some different stuff. And then nitro decided that, uh, it would, those tricks were too big for that video. So we basically almost all the money we spent was, um, building that stuff that ended up being like NBC specials and helped us get world games and stuff. But, um, so the first video, I kind of, it was just the, the filler. Yeah. So, which I was actually still pretty stoked on the video. We had, we had a lot of fun with it, but, um, the videos are what I live for because you get to go with your friends, you get to go build stuff. And now it's not shoveling stuff as much. Yeah. You can still go backwards and you know, we still go to Croom and you know, two stroke mm. week and shovel yeah. these lips and different stuff. But at the end of the day, it's, it's welding ramps and seeing what you can build and like the double backflip 360 Aussie roll. Sorry. You all yeah. um, scooter kids, man, taking over the world, <laughs> <I know. laughs> naming everything, doing it all first. Um, so basically that. And I mean, back to back, double backflips with, uh, with Harry Bink and, you know, the triple backflip, double backflip train off like the same takeoff with BMX and moto down this huge hill, like just gnarly, gnarly stuff. I mean, um, smagical feels, uh, Smash A. <laughs> Dude, he's the man. He is the man. <laughs> he, is, he lives with goats in a mountain, in a hut. It sounds bad, but yes, it's all true. <laughs> he loves those goats and they're badass He goats. just don't say loves his goats. <laughs> <laughs> so he jumps up onto a van, um, does a nose wheelie across the top, grabs the front brake and front flips off to the wheels. It took him like six tries and he was very, very not happy about the other ones. But the fact that everyone's like, oh, front flip ramp does everything for you. I'm like, no, he just did it with his front brake. Mm. Like, I mean, the stuff in this video is, is, it's pretty next level. So really excited. So we got a day in the life piece that's coming out, um, that basically worked with the guys from black rifle coffee. Um, oh yeah. Super cool. Ronnie Mack came out, man. We, uh, we couldn't find anyone else that wanted to jump over a helicopter while I was shooting a minigun, um, blowing up cars with C4 in them while I went under the <laughs> guy driving a car. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff going on. Oh, Ronald. And Mac shows up drunk. And I'm like, dude, well, because his car broke down or so he said the day before, so he didn't get the test day. He shows up, like, not even out drunk, just hungover. And he, he gets out and he's like, how far is it? Or he said, how far can I go? 
And I'm looking, I'm like, well, we measured out. It's about 165 feet peak to peak sweet spots. About one. He's like, I'm not blind. How far can I go? <laughs> I was like, well, I, I don't know. It's like 150 foot landing and 160. It's like, dude, the screaming Eagle won't go that far. Just freaking put on his goggles and took off. I was like, what the hell does he mean? And I never looked at a jump that way, but Mac, he like opened my eyes. He's like, if the bike won't possibly over jump, hit it flat. Why? And we can obviously he goes it, anything under 200 feet, peak to peak that has over 300 feet that your sweet spot is. He goes, it's just wide open. <laughs> I was like from 200 to 300 feet is wide open. He's like, yeah, that's as far as the bike will go. Brilliant. Anyway, so stuff like that. Um, also, Ethan Roberts got on the top of the car with Andy Bell driving and jumped the 180 foot jump, which Whoa. was pretty sick. So he was like on a roof rack, which is a horrible idea. Um, Phil and I backflipped onto the the car. That was kind of how we got around for all the all the stuff. And I don't know. It's just it's a really fun video. That's my biggest project for the last year. So yeah. it's been been awesome. Uh, day in the life. We had Lindsay was flying a helicopter. Um, she flipped a razor and just some tied in the family a little bit. But that'll be released uh, probably before when's the podcast coming out i don't know probably next week yeah might be released might be released now go check what where, where would it be at for uh, people that nitro circus youtube channel yep cool guess, yeah. where a ton of good shit is yeah so you can actually, just go there and watch like a you lot should just of go stuff there anyway yeah sponsor plug there you go um shameless it's crazy to think how much of your life has been documented and not in the term of like kardashian documented like <laughs> crazy 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 shit that has you know, like we said, pushed an industry along. Like, is it hard to still like do the filming or like, where's that passion come from? No, the, the filming's where almost all of us are passionate about. I feel like it, to do something really scary, like we were talking earlier this morning to do a double backflip off of regular super hicker ramp or a 360 where it's really a good 360 wheels kind of down the whole way around. That's always going to be hard. It's never going to get easy. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, there's certain things that get easy. Sue man, sea crab, but now they're doing Sue man, sea crabs and backflips and there's everything has its, has its risk, has its danger. So at the end of the day, if you can take all this stuff and just work on stuff that's never been done and yeah, it's more dangerous. Yes. Yes. It's bigger. Yes. The ramps are bigger. Yes. The landings are bigger, but let me work for six months on something that no one has ever seen before. It's going to blow the minds of everybody. That's what we live for because all the other stuff is like, once it's done, you're like, well, great. Harry Banks, seventh guy in the world ever double backflip bike. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. It's still scary as shit. And you know what? He's not the first. Yeah. So Harry's going to go out there, but he does a rock solid front flip. Okay. Now you're the first. Yeah. Now you've done something that you know, is, well, and that'll the last, you know what I mean? Like that's the kind of stuff that like, you know, you with the first double and then who was the first 360? Was it? Yeah. Fuck off. Was it Deegan? See this is this, <laughs> this, this, no, this, okay. Well, that's like Kerry with the backflip. Like he's never going to live. Like Kerry was, was yeah. Kerry the first dude to do a backflip? Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? But it's like, it's but then it. everyone forgets about Caleb White, who was actually the first one to ride away from jerks. Everyone goes Mike Metzger. Mike Metzger tried to name it, rename it the Mick Fitz uh, after his granddad. I'm like, it's a, a it's a fucking backflip. And B, <laughs> you weren't the first one to ride out of it. You were just the first famous person to ride out of it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's a whole different subject. Yeah. Uh, but for me, Kerry Hart was the first person that showed it could be done. Yeah. Manage the wheels. Like, whatever. I'm not a skater. Like if you are a scooter, well, rider, he was you the, I guess foot, like, fuck it. Yeah. Like, he was the dude that everyone, it was the, he was the four minute mile guy for backflips. Yeah. So like, that's the guy that you have to owe yeah. that thing to. Right. 100%. And again, that'll live forever. Like your double flip will live forever. So. And she needs triple flip. I feel like my house, everyone. That's almost like too much. Let's just Cheney, Cheney. Come on, man. Yeah. But that, you see, that's, that's the thing though. I feel like if a, if you do something at my house, everyone thinks it's like a mythical place that consequence doesn't matter. And like, that's a lot of people will be like, I, I want to learn at your house, but then we got to take it somewhere else. Mm. I'm like, why? And so, well, because when stuff's done at your house, they're like, oh yeah, well that's like, you know, mythical, like it's imaginary. No, yeah. nothing real. Like, that's, that's the video game place. That's the video game place. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Um, but what's cool about that is they can, you know, they can learn it there and they can take it other places, but to be the first person to do something, that's what we live for. We live to push the envelope yeah. and it's not necessarily to do the same thing over and over again or point your toes. We're not fucking gymnasts. Yeah. We want to do stuff that wows people. And that's what actually works about. Dude, the, before you go, when you jumped out of a plane with no parachute, I mean, Look, this, Keanu it, Reeves did it. How hard could it be? <laughs> but this is that, I guess that's like one of the things that really sums you up is because it's like, okay, here's the risk. Then here's how we mitigate the risk. And then you're like, 
Yeah, now that'll work. And then it's like, yeah, <laughs> finding people to, to do it with me was so hard because Red Bull looked at it and they talked to like the top Red Bull guys and they were like the skydivers who Red Bull has their Red They're Bull the Air Force are the yeah. best. Yep. At least at the time, they were definitely the best. Yeah. And I'm like, I want the best. I'm sponsored by Red Bull. Help me. And they went to their top guy and the guy's like, yeah, he's mm. not that good. We just, yeah, yeah, he might die. So Red Bull pulls all of their guys. I'm like, well, shit. Now I'm left with all these B dudes. Yeah. So then everyone's like, well, we're going to lose our license. We're going to lose our license. We can't do it. So I went to the military and I found Plammer, who was a, so the guy that caught me, like that was holding me like stable. There's no way to say that correctly, but the guy that's like <laughs> whole, trying to keep me like in balance. Uh, yeah, so and alive and alive. Um, he'd only had like 15 jumps at that time, but he was a tunnel rat. So he's like, I don't care if I lose my license. Like I a tunnel rat, sorry, a sky dancer. He works in tubes. Yeah. Okay. Does all the like works there. Yeah. Um, so Scotty was like, yeah, let's do that. And then Plammer military guy, he's like, never leave a man behind. I'm like, good enough for me. <laughs> and we had a film guy. He's like, well, I mean, I'm just filming. I'm not really part of it. No one knows who I am. So MX yeah. filmed a uh, guy named MX ironically. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was great. So, were, were you just shitting or was that just And like, our pilot was like 15 years old. So it was great. Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> no one was worried about losing their shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, okay, if I do this, I'm going to have the best of the best. Okay. You can't have the best of best. All right. I'll have everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> have anybody else. Were you just shitting yourself or did you just fully think that was going to be perfect? No, the, the thing about that was I actually, we did one test run where I jumped out and flipped as many times as I could try to get away from the camera or the camera, the, like everybody. And they caught me and tackled me. I was like, well, this is stupid. This is easy. And then it's hard to get something that is easy. That is also with those people with the yeah. right circuit and area that people are going to say, well, the, if you miss, you're going to die. Yeah. Like if you miss all this stuff, it's going to suck. Yeah. Like, okay, that's obviously the biggest consequence, but and we'll be fine. Yeah. So no, I jumped out. And the scariest part was thinking this feels normal. Felt like Matt Huffman. Matt Huffman always goes, yeah, I can't get near an edge. I'm like, why not, man? He's like, oh, I just want to jump. I'm like, dude, that's, that's beyond crazy. You're, you're actually like, you're insane. I like it. But you're insane. So that was when I jumped out, I'm like, shit, I'm Matt Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a thing. Like, so, you know, Jeff Weatherall. Yeah, of course. So Jeff was the last person on the podcast and we were talking about that whole like balance between like he said, when he first started doing base jumping or like wanting to base jump, it was all about ego and like his ego wanted him to base jump. And then he got past that. He had, he said he had a jump where he was like, fuck, okay, that was really stupid. Like I did not have the money in the bank to cash that check. Yeah. And he's like, I can't do this out of ego anymore. So he like, he said there's like that really healthy balance between the ego side and then the smart side of like calculating risk. And then there's the Matt Hoffman that it's just not even a fucking issue. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> oh shit. Where's my shoot? Um, no, but what's interesting about that, the kind of the, the same thing every time on top of a big ledge or something and you, and you got a parachute and your base jumping, you know, the most fun is to step off, just take a deep breath. And it's like peace. And then it's like, whoo, all of a sudden the world just comes up around you and the, the, the wind and the sound and you know, that's the best feeling. And yet every time I'm with a group of people, like I'm thinking, how many flips can I do? And now you're flipping, you're spinning, you don't see anything, you don't feel anything. It's not that spiritual. Like yeah. it's just, it's a big dick measuring contest. Yeah. And I like whether I'll said, I need to get back to the roots and be like, when I'm base jumping, keep it simple. And just enjoy it. Yeah. What's the, you can die really soon. <laughs> what's the thing like, it's like with me working with athletes and stuff, like you got, you get to see a lot of the reasons people do stuff. And it's like, one of the things I, I see is that, and without obviously naming names, but I think that there's people that have demons and their demons are loud. And then it's like what you said, where it's like, you're on the ledge and then that bit where you jump off and it all goes quiet. Like, is that what it is? Do you think to where it's like, you're on such an extreme end of the spectrum that that's the only time it gets quiet, but because of all the noise and all of the demons, I'm going to write the, that down. That was, that was a very well said. We need to actually go over this. Web it's because, recorded. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I forgot, I forgot already, but it was great. But do you think that that's what it is for you? Because like, so there's spectrums of life, right? And there's, there's the guys, I know we said we wrap it up. We'll, we'll try and finish on this, but there's the guys in the middle that do the nine to five thing. Right. And, or 
they're happy to go along and they'll cruise and it's like fun on the weekend. And it's, there's nothing like I'd call that the middle. Then there's the guys on the lower end of the spectrum or that, you know what I mean? And then there's the guys on the extreme end of the spectrum and you fit in that category. And I think that there's, there's a certain amount of baggage that comes with the potential to be as great as what you are. And that is a burden as much as it's a gift. And there's a balancing act to that. So it's like in those moments where you're like, everyone's looking at you going, you're fucking like ridiculous. That's stupid. You can't do that. But is that the only time where it's like "Ah, bit of quiet, bit of peace and quiet from all the noise, but it's that noise that allows you to be you. This is a very deep kind of thing here. uh, And you can't, there's no real way to answer that shortly. So here comes a tangent. (laughs) Um, I think the greatest moments in my life are the moments when time slows down. And I think, um, you know, just even reading the spiritual side for Eckhart Tolle and stuff like that, just kind of like Jed Milton and all the guys trying to figure out like, what is that? Cause like double backflip or any moment that you crash something, um, it's interesting because when time slows down, every sound, every thought, my man, <laughs> now you're good. You're good. Um, but every sound, every smell, every, the touch, the feeling. <laughs> yes. Oh. We've been here way too long. <laughs> I Oh yeah. <laughs> Cheers to the deep shit. Yeah. We're going deep. in. We need going, going in. Going. <laughs> No, thank you. Um, but uh, kind of get, getting back on that, um, you know, does time actually stand still looking into it? It probably doesn't, but when you're fear, when you're adrenaline, when everything goes, you block out everything that you thought mattered because you know what, when your life's on the line, when every decision you make might, you know, you're in the air and sometimes you make a decision to be like, if I jump off now, all I'm going to do is break my ankles. But if I stay on, I'm probably going to die or break my neck or, or get smashed worse. And that's something that a lot of people can't make that decision. And that time when so many people like you're in a car crash or something like, Oh, it's just over before we start. I don't even remember. No, like that's when life gets really simple. And it's not that my life is bad by any means. I love every part of it, but I like the simplicity of racing. You train, you work your ass off. Yes, it's hell, but you have nothing else that you're really worried about. You're just trying to win in freestyle. You know, you're having fun. You're trying to push yourself. You're trying to do stuff that everyone says is impossible, but it's more for yourself. It's to say, can this work? And I feel like the human beings that I found in, in just in life that are the easiest to get along with that are the guys that I would do anything to, to hang with on a daily basis are the guys that have been successful. And it's not because, um, necessarily a- anything about being successful, but it's about that they're confident with who they are and they do things because they now enjoy it. They're passionate about it. They know what they've been to that ego side. They've been to the, I'm trying to outdo everyone's side and they've figured out this, this place where they're actually happy. Yeah. They're not what everyone thinks is going to make them happy. They're not doing something for somebody else. They're not doing it for their parents. They're not doing it for their fans. They're not doing it for fame. They're not doing it for money. It's the guys that, that kind of have, and, and this it can go both directions and you could get caught up in that. Um, but it's the guys that have enough money to get by the guys that have enough fame to not need to take somebody else's. It's the guys that have enough, um, enough success to not have to do stuff, but still do it anyway. The guys like Matt Huffman, who is, he just uh, shattered his heels doing a 900. The guy's like 50 years old. Yeah. And on like the 30th anniversary of the first time he did a 900, he was like, I'm going to go do a 900 today. And he shattered his heels and he's in the hospital and he's getting surgery. And he's like, totally worth it. Was there any money online? No. Did anyone care? No. He had an iPhone sticking like that. He filmed like not even the crash on. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, he does it for him. And anyone that's in action sports, the money is not worth it. And I will tell any kid this right now, like the money is not worth the risk. The fame is the redheaded stepchild of doing what you love to do. So if you want to get famous to get famous, that's like the worst. That's like you go into guys like Steve-O and, and it's, it's awesome. And yeah, he made some money along the way, but yeah, now you have it to where you can't go out without everyone knowing who you are and what you're doing, but you don't have enough money to do like Dale Earnhardt Jr. Yeah, just yeah. like he's got his own town. Like he can just yeah. have his own friends and his own little, yeah. little compound. Um, I've got a good mix where you're That's not That's interesting be- that you just, I haven't thought about it like that to where like, so the fame is a trap when you don't have 
enough money to and buy that, the that distance is, in a way. That, so, that sounds no, but bad. I think, but yeah. No, but that's like I've been thinking about that, man, in, in a lot of ways. And I think that that's a super interesting point because what does money do? It gets you distance from the things you don't want to deal with really. Right. So it's like, you can kind of push away certain people. You can live in a gated community. You can not have to go to the grocery store, but it's like, that's it's sort of, of, it's still, it's a, it's you, you, the price of fame is high. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> Eminem said that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, um, at the end of the day, if you do what you love to do, then every day, is successful. It yeah. doesn't matter what your success rate is as far as financial or anything like that, um, or wins or victory or, or that, like do what you love to do because you love to do it. But if you're doing it for any other reason, you're going to get there and realize that the ride was like the journey was yeah. the best part. Yeah. And that's what I've been very fortunate to have people around me and to be able to do Nitro Circus now where they say, what's your biggest accomplishment? I'm like traveling the world with my family to do what I love to do. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's tough because we're still not, I'm not famous. I'm at a very low level of fame, but there's not an airplane ride that I don't get waken, woken up on. Yeah. Um, you know, which is, which is fine. Um, you know, I love that the day they stop doing that stay, I have to go back working instruction or, or doing yeah. something with my, which is fine too. But, um, you know, it's every time you're at dinner, it doesn't matter what country you're in. There's two sides of that speak. coin on every, you know what I mean? Like yeah. there, there, there's a yin and yang to everything. It would, yeah, and everything has its its ups and downs. Just yeah. make sure that if you're doing something for the fame, know that you're like what you're doing because if you're just famous, it's it's. I mean, yeah, every every plane ride, every dinner, every it's, it's not a lot, it's not bad, but every time and now it's social media, um, and everything's live. Yeah, every time I'm at the bar, there is someone that's filming at any given time. Yeah, so anything that I do that's dumb that even if it's taken out of context, even you're, you're joking with your buddy or whatever, everything that I say is recorded. And most of the time it's actually on, I mean, now would you have the, just like, they'll just leave it open like uh, Facebook live. Yeah. And there'll be some random person that's Facebook live in the entire thing. And you have no idea you could be having a date with your wife and it's on, it's on the internet. And that's, which is, it's fine. Like I, I, I accept that. Like my dad goes, Hey, <laughs> you complain, just come back, work construction yeah. in two years. Everyone forget all about you. Yeah. And, and he's, he's right. And it, it is worth it. But, but again, it's like, you can bear that burden when the, on the flip side of that is you get to travel the world and you get to do the, the things what that you, you love you to do. do. Like it, the juice is worth the squeeze when it comes to that side of things. And like, that's the thing that I think that, um, like I've definitely found that if you focus too much on like the shiny toy at the end, half, like three quarters, so like, 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 let's say you want to make a million dollars. Like if you're just driven by the outcome of a million dollars, first of all, there's a million ways to make a million dollars. So what's the, what's saying the way that you chose is the way that's going to get you there. And then you've got all these options going through your head. And then when you start to get to like, you can see like the million dollar thing, you're like, Whoa, I'm getting pretty close. And all of a sudden you've got a big house, you got a car, a million dollars kind of isn't the goal anymore because on the road to making that million dollars, you've kind of accumulated all this shit to where you need more than a million dollars. So then you shift and then you recalculate and you go, well, fuck, I kind of need $2 million then on the road. To, so it's just, you play this catch up. So it's like, if the destination and the shiny toy is the thing that you have as a focus, you need to enjoy the ride because the ride's all there is. Cause the only, the shiny toy is like the end of the fucking, when the curtains close. So it's like, if you can't enjoy the thing that gets you to where you think you want to be. Everyone says the good old days. I'm living the good old days. And I've been very fortunate that as much as my dad is an asshole, like the guy that I love the most in this entire world and has taught me the most and that I respect the most. But it was the one thing that he has told me is like, dude, it's, do what you love to do for as long as you can do it. Yeah. Right. Till the wheels fall off. Well, uh, we'll end it on that. That's fucking epic. And I really appreciate you doing this. You definitely didn't have to. Thanks and, for your time. Uh, yeah. No, thank you for your time. And we're, you're, we're only four beers. Uh, four beers deep. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, appreciate it, Trav. Well, shoot, now, now I gotta have my wife pick me up. <laughs> <laughs>